Hey, we finally made it. <laughs> I'm having a few odd glitches. I got a new computer and it's, it's uh, been a lot of fun trying to sort out. Uh, some fully sorted it out, but <laughs> hopefully we can use a few images if we need them and uh, otherwise. Hey, welcome. Nice to uh, see some of these names popping up. Well, see all your names popping up. Some of which I know, some of which I remember and have seen recently. Uh, yeah, I do hope uh, you all will take opportunity to uh, punch in comments, the ideas. Uh, I do, as you all know, uh, everything I do is related to a particular kind of painting, and uh, you know, I'm the only, and the only thing I'm a, truly an expert on is is my own painting. So you know, whenever I'm offering you know my advice, I'm not offering you the grand picture of, uh, you know, the arts as a whole, uh, except to the extent that they happen to coincide and, um, and you can derive that, you know, uh, for yourself. Um, so uh, I'm eager to, to, to be of some value to you today and uh, just have some fun with you uh, as much as we can. So I, I'm going to be looking, this may be a little bit awkwardly at this um, screen from time to time. <laughs> And, um, and I see here uh, YTP yelling, uh, if you guys want other names in there, type other names uh, uh, saying hello. And I'm saying hello to everybody. Hello, Jocko. And let me just go ahead and jump to your questions. They're sitting up here already. So this is a way to get in, get in quick, right? Questions, here's Jocko. Question about composition and design using the harmonic armature or uh, diagonal division of any rectangle to locate placement of objects within the frame. Yeah, I'm not familiar with that. I don't use that. I mean, everything I do is by eye. Uh, I don't use any of the, um, you know, golden mean uh, strategies or any of those sorts of things. And so I'm not anybody you should talk to about that. Um, that was the Myron, the world of Myron. What was his name? Myron, uh, yeah, down in uh, New Jersey a few years ago. And I know there's some connection of that, you know, with that stuff done through the uh, uh, Aristides uh, group. But no, don't ask me to, to, to provide you that. The one thing I like about the golden mean, uh, yeah, I think of it this way. It's like its value. It reminds me a little bit, you know, in talking about this, it reminds me a little bit of the, um, of the, uh, of the uh, what do you call it? The uh, uh, pi, right? Uh, three point, a number that just goes on indefinitely. And I like to think of, of a you, the, the, the spot you're looking for in some sense, like on a line. I like that spot that sort of isn't easily divided. I, th that's, I, I think of that as a live spot. And that's one of the things I use. But I also just look at the line and I say, that's a good looking location. I like the way that feels, the proportions, the way that feels in proportion to the whole and the two sides to each other. And I base everything I do on that sort of a thing when it comes to spatial orientation. Uh, so, yeah, I'm not, definitely not, I've, and I've read that stuff, but I've never found that. I, I found that those things strike me as being like more like cages, but maybe you can, maybe you can put something more to me, uh, Jocko, we can discuss it further, or, you know, alternately in a way that might, I might be able to offer you something. Is this moving up by itself, Mr. Producer? Am I going to be seeing maybe a little more of the previous ones? Or maybe I should turn this thing a little bit. Okay. Okay. Tattoo Nouveau, hey, that's a name I haven't heard before <laughs> much. Michigan, how many, yeah, we've got a number of friends out there. If you haven't seen them yet, John Peterson, a student of mine, is out there somewhere in Michigan. Somebody recently told me where and I've forgotten. So John, if you're online there, you know, maybe you can look up these guys. Uh, <laughs> Gabriel, don't overdo it there with the master stuff. Um, uh, Lejeune, is that, would that be right? Lejeune from Virginia. That's quite an astonishing first name. I'm never, I'm going to pretend to pronounce that one. Um, Dennis, hello there. Um, all right, regarding composition, Jocko, did Boston School or Paxton or Hunter utilize the harmonic armature? I don't think so. Uh, dynamic symmetry as per Michael Jacobs. I don't think so. I don't think so. I don't think any of us were into that kind of approach. It was entirely visual. Felt. Uh, Hunter took that approach to the course. That it was all taste, and if you didn't have taste, there wasn't any help for you. <laughs> so, no, I don't think so. Uh, certainly not me. I mean, I'm just going to assure you. Um, I've read all that stuff, dynamic symmetry and all that sort of stuff. I don't, I just don't work that way. I haven't found formulas particularly helpful, but I wouldn't tell anybody else not to do stuff with them. Uh, in the end of the day, it doesn't matter whether you obeyed a law. It matters whether it's beautiful, you know, whether whatever you did is great. So I'm not convinced about the, um, 
applicability even of the golden mean in a way that wouldn't keep you just, uh, uh, you know, thinking you're doing something right but not visually questioning it constantly. If you do, well, that'd be great, you know. Keep questioning whether it looks good. Jovan, <laughs> you're not Jovan Pulitzer, are you? <laughs> good day, evening, everybody. Yeah, where are you? That's an interesting question, yeah. Uh, you're welcome, uh, uh, Tattoo. I appreciate that uh, comment. Uh, yeah, you know, it's not so much I'm trying to inspire. I just have a sort of a way of, um, that, so the road I've been through, I find, has always inspired me. But I think it just goes with the territory, you know, the, the, the good, the beautiful, the true, you know, the elevation of the human mind, soul, whatever. Um, and, and just beauty itself in the, in the pursuit, you know, at least for us as an Impressionist, but I think for everybody, but certainly for an Impressionist, for somebody who's actually looking at something, you're, you know, you're waiting for that sort of strange magic that makes, you know, that, that, that delights, you know, so, yeah. On timing, should a student of oil painting learn to cultivate um, patience or speed? I, um, I've struggled with losing interest in a painting before it's completed. Yeah, the, you know, you're going to lose interest in any case if you take too long on it. That's a really interesting point. Uh, you know, one of the ways to t think about it uh, is, you know, if you're impatient, you need to learn patience. <laughs> if you're a rush, if you're if you're a rusher, you need you need to learn patience, right? <laughs> but if but but on the other hand, uh, there's a plotter thing that isn't a healthy thing. And you remember Soroya's comment: if he couldn't paint fast, he couldn't paint at all. So just keep looking up, in my view, and just say. You know, is the quality there? Is the quality there? And, uh, you know, there's, w once it's hanging on the wall, I want to say that was a Daniel Green comment. Once it's hanging on the wall, nobody asks how long it took. <laughs> what are they asking, you know? I, I, I don't know if I've uh, said this to you all before, but my, my, my wife, I remember her commenting one time that about how quickly she'd made a meal, you know, and it took only so long. And, uh, and I remember having to say to her, and if I've said it to you before, so all of you apologize, but, <laughs> but, but at some point, I was having heard that once or twice, I started thinking about it, and I said, you know, so when you get to the pearly gates, and Peter's sitting there and trying to determine whether, it, whether you deserved a little to come through, he's going to say, what did you do? And if you say, well, I made meals for my family, and is, is his question going to be, did you do them really fast? You know? Is you know, <laughs> it's going to be. Was it good? Was it was it was it good for health? Was it good? For, and it, did it taste good? You know, it's what he's, <laughs> I would bet, right? <laughs> so isn't that always the question? You know, are the paintings on the wall? Does it? You know, really, just it's not, it's not even an issue. So, on the other hand, you know, it's like in the in the world of Vermeer. You know, you see that he seems to not have done a ton of paintings, but. Um, and in, in other cases, a sergeant, uh, Rembrandt, I mean, we're talking hundreds and hundreds or thousands of paintings. Uh, so if you can bring the quality, you know, if you can always bring the, the sort of the music you hear and, uh, and bring something of value, I don't think there's any reason to even discuss it. But you might just find that there's value for yourself. If you're a, if you're a runner, you know, you might want you might want to become a, a meditator, you know, might want to become a more thoughtful person and uh, see what that gets for you. That's my sort of way of thinking in general, what I've experienced. So Theodora, there you are. Sweden, how are you? Yeah. Um, so, oh good, <laughs> glad to hear that. <laughs> That's not a surprise uh, about your name. Um, follow up to speed, how can I improve the speed of my painting? And yeah, by the way, guys, as long as nobody else is on here uh, digging, throwing questions at me, uh, do that. You know, you know the quote from, uh, um, uh, from uh, Leonardo where he says, he says, uh, you know, take whatever time it takes first. Speed comes later. Do well first. And most of what we do is about getting our heads around what the nature of this thing is. And the second part of it, you know, and then getting good at it however long it takes. And then you are going to look for, um, for ways to do it faster. Uh, mostly I find the reason I'm tedious when I was a student and being tedious, it was because I didn't know what the heck I was doing at a given point. So I would say there's some pro problem over here, never be able to figure out what the problem was. So if you can't figure out the problem, you're going to be painting areas over and over again and you're going to be getting, that, that'll be, that's very tedious. So one of the things you might consider doing is uh, problem solving. Just think to yourself, now is this a, you know, when you see a back straggler in your painting, you see a part that needs adjusting, you say, well, is that, a, is that an angle problem? 
is that a values problem? Is that a uh, shape problem? And uh, and nail it, narrow it down, narrow it down. And then when you are going to fix it, don't just poke at it, but actually get a get a concept again of whatever it is that thing is doing that way in relation to things. And then look at your painting and try to pre-picture it on there. And things tend to go faster. Uh, but that's one thing that I, I, I would bet you would speed it up. Yeah. And, uh, uh, yeah, patience. Uh, Jim, sketch testing. I guess I haven't seen you before. Have you met the landscape painter Stapleton Kearns? Yeah, uh, Kearns actually got me. <laughs> he got me my first studio. I, had, I, I moved into his studio. It was thanks to him that I even knew the tricks of getting in and you know, sort of, you sort of squatted at the Fenway Studios to get a studio in those days, <laughs> because. Um, but the but but so he I so I took over his studio and but he knew the he knew the trick, and he had come in after a guy named Cummings who knew the trick. <laughs> so it's one of those things. An opportunity knocks, and Stapleton was great. Uh, okay, so. Um, uh, yeah, let's see what you said about him. Have you met Stapleton Kearns, who also said in a gamble, yeah. What do you think of one of his maxims? You can't observe good design into a painting. Yeah, that's, I'm going to take a second. I'm not sure I know precisely what that does mean, what you can't observe good design into a painting. I mean, does he mean you can't just look and think it's going to be good? Uh, you know, one of the things I say to people when you're, when you're out landscape painting, and I assume that's what he's talking about, when you're out landscape painting, the painting, I believe the painting should be initially a pretty good design. Now, that means you need to understand what is the nature of a good design. <laughs> but otherwise, I think you'll wind up, if you are going to take whatever painting you take and then turn it into a good design, which is your, th your you know, just do the same tricks to it all the time. Find a road in and do this and do that. Pretty soon, all your paintings will look the same in a way that I don't think is good. But if he means that you can't just copy what you see and have a good design, that would be true. That would be true. But on the other hand, if you don't understand composition, you won't find a great spot. And I think you should find a spot that already is inherently pretty good in design. And you actually, for example, need to figure out what the center of interest is in anything you're doing. And then place that extremely well and make it as big or small as makes sense to the picture. Yeah, and then whatever the follow through is, you know, um, but composition is a long, good discussion, a uh, wonderful one. So yeah, I don't know what exactly what he means. If you know more, but having spoken to him, tell us again. Try again. At, stick at that one again. Uh, Chicago, Javi, Jav. Yeah, do you know uh, Ken Manami, uh, Javi? Uh, greetings from Chicago. As a self-taught artist, I'm truly grateful to listen and learn from your experience. Thank you uh, for that comment. appreciate it. Yeah, uh, you know, it's, uh, in a sense, it's all I have to offer, except that you know, what I've done is I've tried to, uh, you know, learn to paint. Uh, <laughs> well, if you want to say like to camp, I just always tried to stay on the track. I didn't have an ambition to go and uh, 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 make a name for myself and do odd things. I just tried to figure out what is the nature of this thing and do it really, really well. And then I figured whatever, whatever comes of that is ideal. So I think that I, to those people who are, you know, have that kind of at least initially a sort of a simple mind I think can be a benefit. I think I've been in some places that you will visit as well. Most of us will have to go so to significantly through the same things. Obviously, it's the same medium, so on. Um, meaning the artist needs to be able to rearrange the scene to make good. Yeah, as I said, uh, that's what I thought he might mean. And yeah, so I see the students will come in and they'll immediately say, to what should I move? And the question is, do you understand what you have? Because that'll tell you what you're going to be moving. But that's where you have to get your head around what the main line, for example, is of a composition. Um, and um, uh, uh, or even the color scheme and that sort of thing. It might not even be a question of moving something as, as adjusting a color or eliminating a color. But um, yeah, that, that um, don't overrate that, though. Don't don't expect you're going to be moving a lot of stuff around if you have if you have a good eye. If you can actually find compositions that make sense. One of my students, uh, John Peterson, I've mentioned to you from who's up in Michigan somewhere. He's got a very very good sense, an innate if you want to call it an innate sense or or whatever he's done to sort himself out. He's not a young painter. I mean, he's not a kid anymore. <laughs> and uh, but there's something about finding a good spot, and you can torture yourself for a while. You'll just torture yourself. Can't find the perfect place. 
at some point, you know, the model of sitting down and just getting your, getting your viewfinders, you know, getting your frame going so that you can actually say, uh, you know, give yourself a shot at finding one is the first thing. Can you uh, even begin to see that? Uh, there, you know, or use your hands or whatever you want to do to, uh, to look through. But I think the most important thing in composition initially anyway is, uh, is, is the frame. And I think a lot of people, if you're subject oriented, you might put a tree up in the middle of the picture and then you'll start manufacturing stuff or whatever, adding things. And I can't, I don't think that way. I actually think holistically from the beginning. I actually want to see it fully framed, you know, built up pretty, uh, uh, I mean, I mean, all there. Uh, so fully there. So, so I'll tell you, um, yeah, but you will, you, there'll always be adjustments. It's a little angle if you have something going on that needs that, you know, a, a, the fence line might change a little bit or, and that sort of, sort of thing. But, um, um, all right, uh, so, oh yes, I'm here drinking coffee, <laughs> enjoying this. Hey, you tell us also what time it is over there in Sweden. Give us an idea. I think you're six hours, I'm betting you're six hours different. Um, Thanks, Mr. Producer. I'm sure I'm learning to follow your, your lead here a little bit with these cameras. Whitaker's uh, got a couple cameras on me today, and uh, I'm going to have to make sure I pay attention. Uh, so, um, yeah, I'm betting over there. What is it? Two here, so it must be like uh, it's early, later. Yeah, later. So it'd be like 8 o'clock over there, I'm thinking, maybe in Sweden. Just guessing. Um, what do you make of the Art Renewal Center and their salon? Are they legit or a cargo cult? <laughs> What's missing in classical academic realism? <clears throat> Have they missed the forest looking at the tree? Uh, interesting question, Jocko. I have made a few comments. Uh, you know, I, I'm, this is, what they, what they represent is a real value for us, uh, you know, in the sense that they, they support and promote representational painting. I think the difficulty you inevitably get into uh, is when you have, it can turn into something like a cult and it looks beginning to look like it's the new photorealism, you know, it's sort of everything seems to be based on Bugro, even seemed to be that based on that from the beginning. And uh, so, but I'm trying to, you know, I, I, would, I would, you know, hope that they could become more expansive. Uh, the kinds of things they give prizes to and that sort of thing, you know, it suggests a fairly narrowing down. and. You know, if they have this model and say not not well educated by the eyes of painters and uh, or of, of or of history, you know, in a great sense, but they're simply focused on the on the um, uh, you know the salon type of painting, which is clearly the case. You know, um, that's understandable. The degree to which they I mean, I can't imagine. I mean, I don't see work. I guess you'd say uh, that looks at least. I don't much look at it anymore, so I can't be too good about this, but too, 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 what's the right word? Too good a judge. But I did, I haven't seen much that really suggests that people are using their eyes in the, say, the Boston School sense, uh, and really, and really bringing the beauty of nature as much as realism, you know, the realism and noodling and all those sorts of things. And the camera seems to have this enormously so I, I don't want to say more than that, but I really th value what they're trying to do, and I stay on their website with my with my ads, and I owe you guys some money. I owe that ARC people, so forgive you, forgive me for that. But um, but I do respect that, and uh, hope that we can just expand somehow. It's a conversation I need to carry on with them as well, and so you should too if you see that. Um, yeah, there's a bit of that. Yeah, the academic the academic has become this new thing, and Gamble is definitely part of that. Um, so Theodore, I also do my own live streams and you're so lucky with Mr. Producer, I hate that. <laughs> I know, I know, I really like what we're up to. Um, I'm assuming Mr. Producer, the light just went out over there. I'm switching my eyes to the other one, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm learning, I'm a tough, t I'm a tough teach, I admit. <laughs> All right, that's really good though. That's, I'm really glad to see that, um, that I'm getting catching on to this. Yeah, it is funny, yeah. Um, uh, Theodora, you can type in there for me, if not for others, what your where to find you. I'd I would look at a live stream or something if you were doing it at some point, just 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 for fun. Uh, Art Renewal Center. This is Theodora. Photocopy. I also work from photos, but it's so funny when you see the depth effect the camera gets. They paint that. Shocks me when I see it. Yeah, 
yeah, I hate to have the camera be the new eyes of the universe, you know, and and then uh, when you combine that with then the way everything comes out over the internet having really been shifted even further because of the hyper focus of cameras these days. And, oh golly. Yeah. Yeah, I'd, 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 you know, I'd love to be this guy. I'd just simply say, let's just stick with we paint. We see pictures in person. We we see pictures in the museum. And how about we live in that world? You know, am I just in the Stone Age? Yeah. <laughs> um, Tattoo says, I really appreciate uh, the depth and breadth of your erudition. It seems to me to come into contrast with the current trend of the immediate and short attention span of the public. And my concern is, are we romanticizing about an era in art? Yeah. That's a, it's always a question for us. I mean, I had that question, but I, you know, I, I just said, you know, follow your interest. The world is made out of people who follow their interests. And, and if you actually are doing something of value, the world will be there for you, so to speak. I mean, uh, I don't think there's any question that um, uh, historically, that's why I talk about the form so much, that the form is historically uh, has a value. And we are using our eyes, but I try to redirect people again back to this idea that we're making music, not, you know, we're in the class of a form where it's about the, 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 um, the engaging play of color relations, for example. And, 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 and yes, I do like also that we, there's a human element to it. I, I like the representational, but, uh, but I wonder if, the, and so I sat there as a student saying, so what is this thing that makes it absolutely unique? And it's some of the things you say is, for example, you say, well, it doesn't move. It's not like a, it's not like a movie because it's one shot. Well, what does that necessitate? We got one shot. We got one image. And so, and that goes on people's walls typically, you know, or something. And so there's a decorative quality to it. The, you, you, there's no reason not to. I mean, people need decorations on their wall. And they like pictures of stuff. Or if they just like a particular color. I think I've mentioned to you all before that I was in somebody's house, uh, uh, you know, in a bed and breakfast thing or something with relation to a, a being at a wedding. And, and uh, people were saying, what do you think of that picture over there? This little, there's this nice little, uh, abstract painting on the wall, and they were expecting me to do some, say some nasty thing about it. And I said, it fits the decor perfectly. The color, look at the color scheme in here. I wonder if they brought that in to match their color scheme, or if they designed a color scheme around it. But it itself, this piece had a beautiful color scheme, and it was very fitting. Now, I think a lot of us want in representational painting, we're in it because we actually want something else, which is some, some content about ourselves. So this is color and all that sort of stuff, and it, it's about us. There's an element of connection there. But yeah, I would just ask, I would just suggest that what you try to do is figure out what it can be good for today and isolate that and make it, make it that, yeah. Uh, work on that, try to figure that out. Instead of giving you simply the, all the answers to that one. Um, I don't think it's ever passed public interest, by the way. I don't think it's, I don't think it ever will uh, um, either, just judging by the sheer number of people that want to be, you know, they're out there and taking classes and things like that. There's something going on for us, for a certain number of us quite a number of us. But I suppose it's important uh, to what it means to us as artists, yeah. Yeah, if you stay straight, uh, you know, stay straight and true, you know, stay, stay true to yourself. What brought you to the dance is always the question for me. What brought you to the dance? That, if you bring that, there's probability as other people in the world, you know, have been, have been excited by the same thing, have been, have seen value in the same thing, or drawn in the same soulful way, you know, to the same thing. I'm betting on it, yeah, yeah. Uh, Theodore, there's some good art artists there, ERC right now, uh, photography is taking over, yeah, yeah. As the eyes of the artist, I know, I know, that's sort of a tragic thing because it takes you, you know, I think partly it's because of the, I want to say because of the picture. I'll leave that. I, I have these you know, continuing sort of you know, speculations about it. Well, you just have to call them, even in my case, talk about painting crackpot theories about what uh, the new realism is. But if you keep remembering that what we're trying to do right now is recover from uh, having our legs cut out from under us by what some people think of as the establishment, uh, I guess it, in some way, it, you know, I, I think of it as cultural uh, destruction, you know. Um, you know, when people would speak evil, and lots of the modernists did speak evil of their, their own sort of parent, the, the, the mother art, they would always say nice things because you must about Michelangelo and da Vinci, but then there would be this whole castigation of the entire rest of the history. But um, 
I think I lost my train of thought there. But the um, yeah, but the uh, the takeover photography and all that. Yeah, I got lost there. I apologize. Yeah, I said, there's so much sensory stuff going on here. I am. It, I'm not going to blame myself this time. My old age or whatever. Uh, and every once in a while, Mr. Producer does like take make a move, and here I am looking at the wrong lighting. <laughs> gotcha. You got me. He's probably come over to tell me this light's on over here. So I, I did lose a little bit of that. If somebody wants to put that question back, I'll take it. Um, let's say this. We can also paint something similar to a photo when working from life. Yeah, has this discussion about photo versus working from life. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just don't find it as rich a source, and I don't get the same pleasure out of it. There's a baby. It's because you learn this great mystery of turning the three-dimensional world into two. That you somehow, you're just why, why would it be satisfying, you know, to to suddenly be uh, uh, having that camera do all the work for you? But that just doesn't even talk about the interpretive nature of camera, you know, and the limitations that it brings. Um, your eye can see so much more, and then there's these challenges of how do you how do you allude to that sort of thing, uh, that more, you know? Uh, so, yeah, um, yeah. I don't know, too, and I always wonder if in this generation it's a kind of, you could say we're lost in the romantic past. I've never, however, I've really avoided the romantic past. People said, one of my fellow students said to me that I was that guy, but I th always thought he was that guy. <laughs> Maybe we all think that. But no, I, I worry about the whole idea of romanticizing this. I don't think I'm interested in, I'm not romanticizing the Boston School. I just happened to be found my best practices evolved out of the conversations they were having. And I kept, I kept hearing their voices and trying things and found myself far more capable now than ever before bringing all the things I really wanted to bring. So, but the camera, yeah, I don't know. I think what it is is, you know, the expression cheap grace, if you come from a, uh, so, uh, who was it, C.S. Lewis or somebody talking about that, um, that idea of, of, of uh, you know, of, of the goodness of man and all that sort of stuff. But the grace, you know, being seen uh, as having, uh, uh, you know, or the grace of God or something, you can't just put yourself in this special place by, 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 by using a camera. You can't just be good. There's something that goes on, right? I'm really not being very compelling on this, but the, but the camera is like, you think you can be spitballed over the home plate of life without ever having to cry in the woods like Aang, right? And it's probably true that you can with a camera in some cheap way, but what is that at the end of the day? That's a, just a question, you know. It's a, it, uh, it just makes me feel not well, you know, to, to, to think about that. Now, if it was up to me, I would actually eliminate all the cameras and, you know, uh <laughs> it's worse to me, you know, Degas out there telling you to shoot, take your, he'd take your shotgun out and shoot any plain air painters. <laughs> A different discussion, but I mean, that's sort of the way I feel. I'm a, I'm a camera burner, you know. I would love to have everybody just burn their cameras and start waking up, you know, you find out what your eyes can. You can do with your hands anything you can see once you learn skills, but, uh, but to, to, to deprive yourself of the real stuff, you know. Yeah, why would you? Yeah. So, so you said people like Soroya and those impressionist painters, they were brilliant designers. As a teacher, I noticed the importance of being a designer when painting from life, and yeah, that was the Benson comment that you're always composing. You're always composing. Every thought is about the thing as a whole and what it is I as a function of the composition. It does pay to really, as you go along through life, to keep thinking through what composition even means. You know, uh, interesting, curious discussions that Mel Max Meldrum has, uh, where he implies that somehow or other, unity. The whole point of composition is unity. If you paint a true impressionist painting, it's inevitably unified. If you have your color relationships true. But I have never found that a still life designs itself. You can, you can have a bunch of junk on the floor and take a, sh you know, and paint it really, really good. And at the end of the day, it doesn't mean it's <laughs> yeah. the place, just even the sheer idea of where you're placing things on the page, which he did well, uh, tells me that there's this element of composition right from the beginning. If you can't uh, pick your center of interest, how big is it and, and what, how, how big is it in relation to the frame and where in relation to the frame? I mean, there's this huge stuff. And it's your, your ability to then get it to be in those places. Uh, but that's all the more reason to make sure you're looking through, for example, a viewfinder and trying to see the picture as if it were already done. Is this a good composition? Uh, even before you know composition, you can be reasonably good about that kind of thing. About If you understand, for example, just the idea of balance on the page, the idea of the distribution of things in a way that doesn't feel like half of the, like the painting's gonna tip over. 
some of the Dutch still life does that to me. The ones that sort of build up these diagonal things. I feel like I feel like like trying to f fix them or something like that. Um, it's not purely instinctual, so you really do need to think through that stuff. Uh, Jovan says, I'm not, I'm not sure if this is appropriate for this video. What would you say in the, is the advantage of your full course o over intensive one or vice versa? Yeah, yeah. you might talk to some of those guys who've taken that course, uh, Sean, um, Sean Vale's uh, stuff online. You might communicate with him a little bit. Ask him about that because he's, uh, he's, he's done both now. Uh, the thing about the long term working with anybody, especially if they care about the training of your eyes, is, is significantly there. I can't in six weeks or five weeks or four weeks, whichever course you're in, I can't train your eye and um, I can't educate you sort of to the disciplines of, 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 um, of self-correcting and that sort of stuff. And I don't much try to. I do a little bit, but I don't much try to. The thing you can get across a little bit in a workshop, an intensive like that, in that period of time, is the ideas associated with this way of working, this way of using your eyes and what painting first, what sec painting second. You know, so you can get some, some aspects of method across, but then you gotta really go and work it out and work it out for yourself. And if you don't immediately leave that workshop and put it to work, in other words, try to figure it out now, what you just learned, but still, so that's the bigger part of it. And then, of course, you miss in the conversation the, uh, the application of aphorisms. That, you know, over the, all the course of the year, you'll hear so many of those kinds of things when you're working with somebody who has that kind of a background. So there's this context thing. The guy can walk up to your painting and say anything about your painting uh, and advise you about the surface treatment, for example. Uh, you can't take that kind of time. You can talk about that sort of thing, but you can't take the kind of time like repeating that and repeating that. One thing Gamel said about uh, the way he taught, he says, it's, I, cons <laughs> I consider um, what, I, what I do inculcating. And he, to me, as a younger guy, he said, so do you know what that is? And I allowed that I didn't, because I certainly wanted to hear his definition <laughs> of it. But he says, that means you repeat things over and over until people can't forget them. And that kind of stuff does require more than five weeks. you know. So there's a number of things, and so keep thinking about that kind of thing. But there's a reason why the old atelier model was a good one, the workshop, the bottega, whatever it is. That model was a pretty good one because you had access to this guy constantly. He was constantly. Now, if you're working on his pictures, it was even more constant, even more insistent you get it his way, which means you had to understand what he was up to. Uh, which is why you see so many people like Raphael or, 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 or da Vinci uh, pulling their you know, their, their, the look of their, ver, uh, ver, in the case of Da Vinci, Verrocchio, or Perugino in the case of Raphael, you could see them actually literally being like clones of this guy. So if you can, um, you know, if you can keep, keep that uh, sort of, uh, 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 you know, what would you call the saturation idea in mind? Intensives are pretty intense, but the saturation really does require some years with somebody. And even with Gamma, when I was working with him, I remember getting to a point where I said to myself, you know, he was quite old. I mean, he was 10 years old, more, he was 15 years older than me, I think, when I ran into him, but than me now. <laughs> so here's this guy, and I'm sitting there saying, is he going to die on me? Uh, you know, and I kept looking at myself, watching, to see if I understood everything he was saying, and, would I, and when he came around the corner, would I know what he was going to critique? At a certain point, I was comfortable that he was that I could predict him, that I could predict what he was going to say. So I w my head was into the body of his knowledge, and you know, so you could say uh, you had his mind, and you know, that's sort of the thing you're trying to get at uh, when you're working with somebody. I made that very long. Let me let me get out of that for now, just to get to other people, and you know, be something else like that that might be more might be interesting to you as time goes by. So. Um, uh, did I miss anything there? You know, that's right, the intensive. So Theodora says, I, I, um, an artist doesn't know what good design is. They can end up painting everything as if they're a camera. I don't squint anymore. I blur, which I think is better. Yeah, I d <laughs> squinting and blurring is an interesting one, isn't it? Yeah. I hear people say that. I think they mean half the time the same thing, and sometimes they mean something else. I wish I could speak to you one day face to face. So sorry for bombarding you with questions. That's very interesting. You know, I'm gonna. I'm willing uh, if you guys all want to at some point to have this, to offer a Zoom discussion with you. I may, you know, I may have to limit it, but I limit myself because I will go on indefinitely. Like, you know, the talking thing is a phenomenon that uh, 
you know, what I own, I have an interest in this discussion and I have enough glibness to make it useful. But if at some point, why don't I think more about that and maybe we can actually at least do that much. And maybe a Zoom with any, any one of you guys on a given ba basis. So maybe, maybe some of you can give me feedback, not right here, but uh, you know, through, the, uh, either through my email, which is uh, ingbretson underscore studio at yahoo.com. Ingbretson underscore studio at yahoo.com. And let me know if you are interested in that. Because uh, from time to time, I, I'm doing that. I'm going to meet with a guy today about being a student, but I'm working on a Zoom. But I don't think it's a bad idea. I think that's interesting. Uh, Theodora, Adnerdrum and uh, Jocko says Adnerdrum is, uh, <laughs> and uh, friends are very concerned with storytelling and philosophy and ethics and painting as a medium vehicle for public good. Do they have a point? Is literature the enemy of painting? Now I've never thought that actually. I just think the problem really is if you put it first and haven't learned your trade, which is that what your real job is to bring visual beauty, right? Is to is to, is to make music, is to make visual music. That's your job. I don't think there's a second job. <laughs> but what your subject is, that doesn't have to be mean, it doesn't have to be minor, it doesn't have to be, in fact, I remember as a student looking at the Boston School guys and thinking that's, that's sort of underwhelming, you know, some of the stuff they did. But the longer I live, the less I care, you know. And then the more I look at these pictures I thought were so important and there's so much to say, I can't even, now I'm thinking to myself, those guys didn't know what they were talking about. You know, so you put yourself in an interesting place. If you're talking about, I suppose, trying to influence the day, I'm not a big fan of, you know, the culture of, you know, anything from wokeness to, to your preaching. I'm not, I don't think that's wise. I like the C.S. Lewis model, I think, where he said, um, he said, you know, if you, you can be a Christian all day long, but you need to actually, when you're offering somebody a novel, you need to write a great novel. So, you know, but I wouldn't, I don't underwrite, con you know, I, 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 I'd love to find a metaphor, in a, a, a painting has been, it's been reduced to a metaphor. I really like it. So, uh, I'm, so you could say I'm a sucker for it or any, whatever, but you know, I've talked before about the, uh, and I've shown pictures of the uh, Michelangelo sculpture, um, the, um, of the uh, d captive slave. It's such a phenomenally interesting metaphor of life. You know, I, I don't ever run away from those kinds of things. I, I like that. And I do think that's one of the things painting can do uh, because, you know, that's that still moment. It's just this one moment. You know, the guys who are trying to show an action scene and they get them right into the middle of this great action and that sort of thing, it's all fine, but it's a little bit like painting a person in the middle of speaking. You know, I think over time it gets more tiring. But I don't think they're bad. I mean, I love that painting by, uh, by, by if you haven't seen it, by N.C. Wyeth of the Paul Revere, the horse suspended in air. <laughs> I mean, it's like classic. It's a, like an expression of the idea of, 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 of suspended, uh, 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 like, like the moment of, of, of learning something fearful, you know, and there's this moment of suspended, uh, you know, uh, holding your breath, whatever it was, and he really, he really commands that in a way that I think has, you know, it's pretty impressive. It's also a, a wonderfully painted, you know, pictorially. So that has the music, you know, and that sort of thing. So uh, when, when painting a portrait, how many hours sit sessions with a sitter do you aim for? And do you work on the painting only when the sitter is present? Yeah, I will work on aspects of the painting to go start from the back of that list. I'll work on aspects of a, a portrait um, from, I will work on the, um, uh, certain details of drapery and stuff like that. If I, if I, you know, if I'm finding myself just being tedious with the sitter, I'll do that. Uh, you know, there was this whole discussion about not using lay figures. I think even Ang was involved in that. He wanted everything done from life, but he was found to be doing that. You know, we'd have the draperies hanging over a um, a, a, a newel post or something like that that he was dr painting from for a picture he was working on. We all do that. I do that. I don't see a way around it. Uh, at this point, uh, I try not to though. I'd, I'd prefer not to. I'd prefer to have the thing just like any impressionist thing to be there of a piece. So I try to set up. But the fact is, as you ask, you know, I ask for a minimum of, uh, I ask for 15 to 20 sittings. I ask them to, to give me 20 sittings if I need it. And I typically need something less than that. And other times, uh, uh, wish I had more. I don't try to rush it. But, but I find that mostly I can get everything I want in the, um, in the range of uh, 30 uh, to um, range of 40 hours, roughly in the range of 40 hours. And it, even, the, even the more, the slightly more complex ones, I can do that. But you really have to stay on the course. Now, if you become a hyper-realist in doing all, you can't do that stuff. And you'll, you'll wind up painting everything with the, 
you know, with the model going all around, they're doing noodling all sorts of little things. I don't do that uh, much, but a little bit, yeah. Um, yeah, so the hours I tr with, with a sitter, you, 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 you take what you can get. You, you don't want to make your sitter exhausted and have them come back sore the next day or that sort of thing. So if you're getting consecutive sittings, you, I aim at something just around two or a little bit more. Uh, if there are sitters who come less frequently, I'll go to cl closer to three. But you exhaust people at three hours, so the two-hour sitting is, 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 I try to get minimally that much because I find it difficult to just get myself fully back into it in less than an hour, and that gives you a good hour of working time with yourself fully invested in all the things you did before, and uh, you know, the big, the big impression, the reminders of the big impression and that sort of thing. Um, but the longer they've been away, the more you have to revisit, and it, you know, and you forget what, you know, aspects of what you're working on. If you take notes, you'll forget them. So, yeah, those are the thoughts about that. Uh, oh, I see, yeah, yeah, I do, come on over, I agree with that, the Zoom isn't the same thing, yeah, yeah, good point, <laughs> I see what you mean, it is vicarious. Uh, as painters, what's our responsibility as society, what are our obligations to public good? Paint straight and true like a Christian and live that way too, paintings of beatitudes improve life. Yeah, I don't know, I don't know about that, I don't know about that, yeah, I've never, I've never really been that convinced. Um, yeah, paintings of beatitudes and stuff. I, I don't know. I've never liked moralizing stuff. I don't even like it in writing, you know. But I do. I do like in writing. I like a story that has a that that teaches me something that has a has a moral element or something to it. But that, uh, yeah, it's a question. I, I think that one of the great things you do is to figure out your medium and stay within it and don't cheat it and don't pretend to be three things you're not and not do well at your, you know, just be good at your cobbler, stick to your last, you know, be good at your trade. Sort of hear you. All right. Sorry about that, guys. We're having a significant audio difficulty today. Uh, bear with me. I'll try to hang a little longer at the end so we can uh, make up for that. Are we, are, we, are we coming around, Mr. Producer? They can sort of hear you and me. Uh, all right. Um, yeah, the, I could just briefly talk about the tattoos one. Like you got it. You really got me. Um, uh, and you're adding that to the idea of, of uh, improving life. Jocko's idea of uh, uh, improving life. You know, one of the things about the subject, if we want to take the time, and if you can hear me right now, and if you don't hear me, let me know. I'll, I'll, I'll revisit this. Let me just tell me. But I'm going to try to do that. But um, yeah, one of the things that I, you know, it, it, we, you know, Aristotle and others talk about the sublime, and uh, they, they mean something like, uh, you know, like the idea of dark things, you know, uh, uh, and 
you know, uh, not jolly dark, but I mean, there's an element of the grandiose and stuff that isn't isn't about pretty, isn't about pretty, lovely, you know, and all that sort of stuff. But um, the um, so I don't think your uh, uh, subject is as much the issue as uh, as your attitude toward it. So I I think at one point I was. Uh, and I, if I mention this, I'm sorry, but uh, I was trying. I was painting a picture of the, the pajamas of the Cambodian, the Khmer Rouge. Uh, they were in the in the in, in the news a lot. Uh, and are we back in pretty good shape, Mr. Producer? Yeah. Oh, good. Thank you. Thank you for your efforts running around. Um, take a break if you want. It's to me. That's a note to me. Oh, okay. Uh, no, I'm good. Actually, I don't need a break. Thank you. Although I should have a drink of water so, since I'm sitting here uh, thinking about breaking. I'm getting very dry. So, um, that, but but so I had this in mind. Uh, you know, th oh, I had heard this story about a um, about these guys who had broken into a church. The the Khmer Rouge guys. Uh, these really vicious uh, Marxist, camp, whatever kind of communists they were in uh, Cambodia, and. Um, and they uh, and they 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 told everybody they could leave freely. They weren't going to get killed, but, it, but unless the, as long as they would go out and either walk on the cross or spit on the cross or whatever that they'd torn down from the side of the um, from the church. And uh, so all but this one uh, person, this young uh, woman, uh, did what they were told and got out of there. And uh, she just got grabbed a hold of the cross and started wiping the spit off of it, or some story goes like that. So here I have a story that's just doing this very compelling thing to a young guy and the heroic in, in me and all that sort of stuff. And the martyrdom thing and all that sort of stuff. And I began to design a picture, but it, but it persistently wouldn't work because I kept thinking about the, um, about the Khmer Rouge. And I, I was bringing like a, a sense of rage to that or a sense of an attitude to that thing. And how do you not do that? And I realized that what I was doing is I was condemning the Khmer Rouge instead of celebrating the heroic. Uh, behavior of the woman. That's, uh, that's the kind of stuff that I think you can watch out for and be aware of. I won't elaborate on it, but that's one of those things where you, where you can have that discussion with yourself. And I think it's much more good. That's my point is that it's good. That's, that's the good. You know, focus on the good, the good, the beautiful, the true. You know, focus on that. Uh, but, you know, still do your best, do your job because you can tell people all sorts of good things, but then you're a fake painter. You know, you're not doing your job. You know, so. Uh, you not you know if you haven't you don't understand your field you, have, you haven't done your proper work to prepare yourself to be a speaker in paint you know what is that yeah and the tattoo thing I don't know what to tell you about that I I do think you can do beautiful tattoos and I think uh, <laughs> I've I've never taken an attitude toward them with good or evil or that sort of stuff but um, but the subject thing again comes up there and you know I don't know what that means I guess I've seen that over and over again uh, then of course you always see the guy <laughs> the guy who had this picture of this girl and has the na girl's name on it, and about 20 years later, he takes the name off and puts a different one. <laughs> Some of these things just intrigue me, but that was deep meaning at the time. You know, I love this girl. You know, I don't know. I thought, you know, don't drag me into that. That's, it's not my field. <laughs> Jock, uh, Theodore says to Jocko, I asked myself that as well. Okay, That's, you got that, Jocko. Um, so, hi, Paul. Thanks so much for addressing my questions in your recent. This is Richard at 098. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hi, Richard. Yeah. It really helped me understand Meldrum's writing and further my understanding of your own thinking once again. That's one of the reasons I like to, to suggest people read or even study it uh, a different way. Because I, and even like, for example, study what I'm doing if you're trying to be an, a, a, uh, an academic because you, you won't anywhere near as well understand your own, your own way of uh, working as, as, as if you had understood, you know, you could say what it isn't, you know, another way of working. Know, what is and then weighing the benefits, but also just more, more and more clearly isolating, you know, uh, what you really have for yourself and what is, you know. I keep thinking, you know, I was raised in both places. I had a foot in both camps from the beginning, and uh, the academic and the uh, impressionist. And I kept thinking, what are they good for? What are they good for? Why do they come together? And I kept trying to make imaginative paintings, imaginative paintings with impressionist color. And I remember with one, I, and this again I may have mentioned before, but I remember doing one with a Jason and the Golden Fleece and this old thing of this. Whatever, and I tried. To, I tried to paint impressionist colors in an outdoor landscape, and it was the goofballest thing you could ever possibly have done. <laughs> that doesn't mean I couldn't conceivably have just picked a stormy day or something and then paint impressionistically. But uh, there's a guy named Arthur Spear who does impressionist stuff with imaginative paintings. He's a guy worth looking at, actually. Take take some time and look him up. 
I believe that's, I believe that's his name. Um, uh, so I, I don't know why I deviated into that from yours, uh, Richard. But yeah, Meldrum is worth looking at. And I still haven't quite gotten to the depths of what he's saying. I, for some reason, I still have, I've been meaning to, but I still haven't picked up the book by one of his students. I think it's called Paint it, See It Painted or something like that. So um, I do mean to do that and so I can make a more sane comparison. Of, uh, maybe I can see better in practice what he's saying, but I, I haven't been able to follow through with, I've read the book the, that they say is Meldrum's book and there's serious elements of it that aren't clear. Uh, so, but the parts where, I mean, the most significant stuff that he's saying is, you know, that what gives, one of the things that gives painting so much authority uh, is it's, it's, it's compelling, um, uh, uh, approximation of, of the truth of visual of the visual you know and, and that's historically been the case and you'll find that's one of those things so um, anyway so I do like that sort of thing that he carries on as well as just saying just, let's just use your eyes you know just the color relations the value relations and learning to see the general tonality of a picture and evolving from the middle tones and all that sort of stuff which is you know sergeant conversation Mr. Producer, the sound. Theodore is yelling, uh, Mr. Producer. That <laughs> well, I guess these are a little bit behind. Huh? Thoughts on censorship, taste, vulgarity. I told you already, I meant to censorship. I want to censor the cameras. <laughs> uh, vulgarity and decency, titillating nudes versus classic nudes, yeah. Boucher and Fragonard, too naughty. Is Bernini's ecstasy if, uh, too erotic? Yeah, that's the kind of question that you have to answer in the course of your life. I had a young student who wanted to work with me, and she said, I won't do it. It's, I think it's immoral to have naked girls and naked boys po posing, uh, you know, p have people posing f for your classes. You know, and she said, I can't even be there. I can't even do still life with you. I, I said, you know, why don't you just come and do still life? But there are a lot of people that take that, and you have to go through that. You have to think that through. And and your, 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 your conscience is important, so of course it is. You know, do the right thing, you know, and these are the days that challenge our consciences, and, but it's always there. Um, so yeah, that's, um, yeah, all those are there, you know, the question of the vulgar. That's why I say, I do believe there's a golden thread. I don't think, think you would say that every painting that every painter ever did is good. You know, any, any given painter, you know, somebody like Titian. And sometimes those are the areas that drag them down. They start and suddenly are in a place that doesn't fit with that model there of this great elevation of the mind and all that sort of thing. If you buy into that, as I do, you know. So yeah, yeah. Uh, censorship isn't an issue to me. I think that's, uh, I'm not a fan of any kind of a, a censorship uh, except for the, uh, you know, anything that protects innocence of children. I'd love to have uh, the, the classes on sex education, uh, I'd love to have those censored from schools. I'd like to have them eliminated completely because these, what they're doing now is obscene and, uh, and uh, shocking and destroys you know, innocence. Uh, in why am I talking about that? Let's, <laughs> let's get back to Peter. You guys, you're, I'm easy to be dragged out. Oh, this is not good, okay. Audio's out, audio's back. Thanks, <laughs> Javi and Jovan. Speaking of <laughs> censorship, hey, now they're, they're relating that to censorship. Uh, to you, Mr. <laughs> Producer. What was I saying that you wanted to censor me like that for? Um, yeah, no, it was actually a battery issue, not, a, not the, not the uh, phone. Okay, the voice of Mr. Producer. Yeah, you finally heard him. Yeah, yeah. All right, sounds good, sounds, 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 sounds. All right. Okay, Theodore wants to hire you, uh, uh, Whitaker. <laughs> Uh, and there's, your, there's the comment, got to check the batteries next time, yep. Uh, okay, what do you think about Thomas Aikens? Any thoughts? Yeah, Thomas Aikens is always, uh, he's, to me, he's the least of the guys, that, uh, the Americans that came out of there, or one of the least. Uh, he gets so over, he gets so blown up into something grand and so, that sort of thing. I don't hate him, but I'm sort of disappointed that he never picked up, for example, the beauty of color. I was looking the wrong way, wasn't I? Thank you, <laughs> you fixed me. <laughs> Uh, uh, the beauty of color, um, uh, for example, he never, he never really seems, and, and by the way, th some of those, the roads, some of the boats on the water, they really do have good color in them, in sort of the same way as, 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 um, uh, as Jerome's do, you know, where you find him being compellingly truthful in color relations outdoors. But I don't know, I mean, I, 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 he seems like he's always struggling, always working too hard. Um, Sometimes I think of Paxson, I think he's coming from the same background and works in a very similar kind of a way. And I think of him as a guy who actually found grace in that way of working much more elevated 
uh, you know, sort of uh, application, uh, you know, just in terms of the, f of, the, of the paint quality and other things. Uh, but no, I'd never, I'd never been able to get in my head around uh, Aikens, around liking him. And uh, I don't, I can't tell you all the reasons, I don't know. I do think he had a little bit of devotion to the camera that might have been problematical, but uh, yeah. And I'm not here to talk negatively about people. Um, um, and there are a number of those things. He's one of those guys that you know, you see that he's talking about using things like the, um, I think the golden mean and certain other things. And um, so I think he might have been more, and he was using cameras and things for different things. So he might have been more technologically oriented than uh, that appeals to me. But no, nah, just the work itself, just looking at the work itself, I don't find many of them that really uh, draw me in. The one of the artist's studio, you know, it's all browns and stuff, and it feels like you've gone way back, you've gone way back, or you're going forward, you know, in terms of the evolution of the uh, ability to see full color. And But he seems to also have been more dedicated to the subject than to the uh, magic of visual, uh, you know, delight. Um, yeah, I'm just, that's just me. I. I don't think we anybody should just pick on him on the basis of anything I say. I, a lot of people do like him, and there are things that I think are worthy. But I don't use him as an example. It doesn't come to me as somebody that when I'm looking for some people, like Americans, to show you pictures of their work. He doesn't come to me as one of those guys. Whereas if, I, if you ask me about Blashfield, uh, I would tell you great things. I'd just say, look at Blashfield. as another guy who comes from a similar background. Did he work with Jerome Blashfield? I'm, that's that one I'm trying to remember. Um, so, um, what do you think of Parmesan? You know, yeah, I like the, some of these guys. I really do get it. I, all these guys way back then are delightful. Um, yeah, the long neck and all those sorts of things. Yeah, um, I don't know why that you want to draw me into that. I'm actually this. I'm actually, <laughs> you know, you know my position on sort of mannerist stuff. I think the, one of those reasons those guys are, they're sort of interesting, but they stay on the side is because they're heavy-handed mannerism. And you know, as much as I've always really enjoyed Boucher, I really can't stand him on another level. You know, uh, I mean, I admire the way he can put a picture together and invent a picture and so well, I'm back to my <laughs> looking the wrong way. <laughs> um, so, um, uh, you know, and I just find that. So I, I like a lot of stuff about a lot of people and a lot of these guys. I don't throw anybody, I don't I have no interest in throwing anybody under the bus. Everybody has some interesting value. But you're talking to students all the time, and you really, you really want to say to them, guys, you know, master nature. Master um, the skills it takes to produce the beauty of what you see in front of you, and use that as your platform. And I think, I, know, I can't imagine that Aang wouldn't have meant that, although Aang was always, he would always have one foot, and he would say the same thing about Degas, or even Van A said, Degas said that about Van A, that they always had one foot in the masters and the other foot in, in nature. And, uh, but, but certainly the inclination of Ang's conversation is it's nature. Nature's the source, nature's the source. So as, and, and that way I think you, what you would be saying is as much as the masters are important, follow the masters as much as they follow nature. So, but, uh, but, I, but I like all kinds of these kinds of guys. I don't want to put tons of time into talking about them though. I have read Albert Bohm. I have I observed that. Yeah, it's a very interesting, very useful book actually. Um, uh, what was it called? The uh, French Academy or something? And uh, but yeah, very interesting place where you actually begin to see the difficulty of taking a sort of an idea picture and having a lot of life in an idea and managing to try to keep that life as you get to the more refined version of that thing that was then going to be used as a decoration on a wall or as a um, as a large painting. Um, always, I mean, that's where you got to give credit to people like. Um, Bougro and uh, Leighton and those guys for keeping that life in that next version. And a number of people just really, it really, they fall apart a little bit. Uh, so yeah, that's very interesting. That's a very interesting worthwhile book. I'd recommend it. What's it, what, I can't remember the whole name of it, something in the French Academy. Um, uh, models historically are poor, where artists, uh, whereas artists can get rich painting models images. Well, that part's true. If you made 60, the, how much do you pay the models? Yeah, given the number of sittings. That's one of those things where my, my, my first position with models is, uh, is uh, such and such a dollar amount. And, uh, and I, don't, I don't think we've ever paid under, we've ever paid minimum wage stuff or anything like that. So um, uh, I'm in training this executive producer here is shifting me back and forth. He says, <laughs> He's trying to brainwash me into looking quicker. 
uh, but um, uh, where was I now? Oh, the image, yeah. So, but I have at times actually shared profits, and uh, that's a question that I think is a really worthy one, you know. And uh, especially if you're talking about uh, prices that go up there and the sort of the levels that Bugro was getting in his own day, you know, it seems like kind of pathetic. You know, we even, you know, even today in or in the world, I mean, we're in these in these uh, mill buildings, and you know, in the, one of the buildings I was in, the person working on this particular um, uh, uh, spool of whatever textile it was, you know, they would get like five cents per spool and the guys would be selling them for five dollars a spool. They never saw anything in there. Now, you could say, well, you got to know economics, you know, there'd be all sorts of other expenses and all that sort of, and that's all real. But there, there's a reason why, why they're thought of as, I don't know if that's where robber barons applies to them, but, but that category of the, of the um, you know, y you're charging so much more than your labor and you know, the idea of the labor being worthy of his hire, I'm completely convinced about that. But, and in life you have to learn to negotiate uh, yourself too, even if you're poor, try to get as much as you can uh, as a model, for example, and figure out if you can live that way as a model and how long even. So, um, yeah, you're, you're, uh, that's, that's a very worthy thought though, I agree, yeah. Uh, how important do you feel that traditional art education is, not meaning a specific style, but more the academic setting? I don't know. Uh, you know, I'm still not convinced about that I, that model. You know, a traditional art education. Uh, what does that even mean? So, but I do think that getting the basics of picture making from scratch from somebody who knows what he's talking about is it's hugely important. I mean, you could spend the rest of your life doing what the what what the uh, Da Vinci's and the guys before them were trying to do, and just trying to figure it out and knock out some kind of pictures. And uh, whereas that's one of the beautiful things about man, you know, we are a continuum, we're all of a piece. And it's, you know, building on the shoulders of giants is one of the things that, is, that makes for the next painting being better than the last and the next painter being better or being more, you know, having more complex skills and being able to bring something of greater, uh, you know, of greater, um, in that sense, greater value. And then, of course, if they're equally good in the aesthetic sense and all that sort of stuff, then you've got, uh, you're improving your whole culture, you know. So, uh, um, it's, I think it's important to have knowledge. Uh, you can't get out of it. You know, say, what, what is it, um, the, 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 the Russian, you know, uh, uh, ignore the past. I'm sorry, dwell on the past and, and, and lose an eye, uh, forget the past and lose both eyes. I think that's real. I mean, I, I think that's wisdom. So, uh, and it's hands-on stuff. That's why, you know, when you're gonna study with somebody, make sure you look at their work. But if you go to a school and you're, you're studying with somebody, you don't even respect their work, why would you do that, you know? And then the fact is you'll study with some three or four or five different people and you can get really seriously confused, which causes its own problems. But no, I think that's important. I do think it is, yeah. I'm not a guy who runs away from that sort of thing. I just don't think the colleges and, and typical institutions are very good at delivering. Historically, I mean, the evidence is there that they aren't. Y Yale used to have a few pretty good people like Sergeant Kendall and uh, the history of Yale isn't the history of a bunch of great painters. Um, and then they go modern with everybody else, so. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a really good resource, uh, uh, Richard. The Albert Bowen book is a really good resource, in my opinion, you know, and there are other let me not try to tell you what other resources there are, but there are a few others too that are that give you some of that background. Um, so let's look again at uh, models in the Bay Area make twenty-five to fifty dollars an hour. Yeah, yeah. Not, I mean, you know, the fact is, when you're beginning, uh, when you're just getting out of school, or if you have no background, no support, it's very difficult to pay models uh, as a student numbers like that. So that's where you wind up using a wife or family member or somebody like that who's willing to <laughs> be a, you know, just be there for the, so we say the romanticism of it and that sort of thing. There are ways, there are ways to do that. I used to have a, I used to have a student who could get anybody to post for him. I don't know if he ever paid them anything, but uh, yeah, funny stuff. Yeah, uh, yeah, but uh, I have found too that the models that are coming in as professionals, I find that they, they will try to tell you how they're gonna do stuff and they off sometimes aren't cooperative too. So I have found difficulties with some of the more professional models. Um, so that, you know, 
you do have to respect, though, I always try to respect their bodies, what they're actually capable of doing, you know, and I try not to pose people in, in dramatically twisted poses and stuff. The best, I found the best m models I've ever had are dancers, though. Um, by far, they have, you know, the bodies are tuned, they can do things, hold things longer, and are much more aware of their body. Um, <laughs> Sorry, Kevin. <laughs> you loved that, though. I'm glad you did. Uh, sex education. We run into that here. I get so annoyed. They would, they would say, I homeschooled my kids partly because of that, but it gets so, they would say they're going to show the curriculum, the sex ed, ed curriculum, and you go to see it. You go, you know, I mean, they really turned out a crowd. They wanted to see what their kids were going to be learning, and they would say, well, we're just showing you what days we're holding it. I mean, like, that's not curriculum. <laughs> What is that you're doing? Everybody's wanting to see what books you're going to use and what the theme is and what your moral standing is when you talk about stuff. You know what I mean? Like, and uh, yeah, funny stuff. Why am I back in that? Uh, my 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 uh, my my producer's laughing. He was in, he was a victim of my you know involvement in that as a student as a kid. Did Degas? Not a victim. I didn't do anything strange. So uh, did Degas or Boston School uh, plan their shape relationships in their paintings, or can you only achieve that through experimentation during the painting process? You guys use words, yeah, plan their shape relationships. You know, everything I know about painting, visit the Boston School, is truly via Gamel, and then seeing these guys and hearing what they say. All indications are from everything I've heard from Gamel, who was, who was well acquainted with all these guys, is that everything was done by taking nature and setting it up and, and, and you know, involving yourself with it visually. Um, but but um, planning shape relationships, I mean, you're always watching, and when the thing comes together, you know, when the group of things that you're placing together comes together in, in pictorially satisfying ways, you know, visually satisfying ways, that really is the thing, right? And, um, and then you start painting. And again, I would suggest, that, not that I have ever heard that from them, that they're looking, as it were, through a viewfinder. They're very aware of the composite, the whole thing. So, uh, yeah, I don't know how you mean that word, plan their shape relationships. Uh, or can you achieve that through experimentation during the painting process? Yeah. Yeah, so you don't, I don't go moving things around. I really make sure it's all set up before I start. And I follow Gamel's model in this way, and that is he would say, he would say, look, you're setting it up, and that just applies to a portrait, an interior, or somebody, a, a, a figure in a room, uh, 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 just a simple still life. When you set it up, he would say, get it set up. So Keep going a little bit. Yeah, let's take a quick break. All right, we're going to take a quick break, guys. Let us fix this, okay? And with apologies, yeah, okay. We'll be back in five. Hope you all got a nice little drink, had a little break. <laughs> I, and I hope our sound's back, it's sounding good. It sounds like we're okay again. Dealing with a couple little different glitch, uh, odd things, so. Um, yeah, let's see where, if I can remember where we were. Yeah, models, uh, poor living. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Let's see. What do you think of illustrators like uh, from the golden age, like Howard Pyle? Yeah, I'm a big fan of those guys. Uh, I don't. Um, I, I consider uh, that group to be sort of as a group as good as any as that you know as any any group at any time. But there's something about N.C. Wyeth, and I've never considered him to be the most you know, I guess there would, would be erudite designer or anything like that. I don't think he's dastardly, but what he's got is this ability to, to, put, to, put, to put you right there. He's, you know, I don't know how many times I've read something with his illustration and I'd feel like he hit it. You know, he's just right there. Like, I see illustrators in which you say, I would have interpreted that differently. But it's amazing, that, that quality that he brings. And then he's got a really nice, you know, sort of juicy color typically and that sort of thing. So it's really, really fun. Uh, eventually he does. Yeah, he's got all sorts of fun things you'd call fun ideas, sort of narratively, pictorially and stuff like that. Um, I do always give room, space for these guys when I know that lots of them are working with really serious time constraints. Uh, book book um, uh, illustration, maybe not so much, but uh, yeah. 
if, if all of you have seen, this isn't painting now, but you know, the Uncle Remus, is it Uncle Remus? Yeah, the series, um, uh, it was a guy named Frost. Uh, but no, I'm as much a fan as anybody of illustration and, um, and uh, have my favorites. <laughs> so, uh, did you want me to say something else about that? I don't know that I much need to. Um, uh, let's see, with resources like YouTube that make so much information so available, it seems like art school really only provides an excuse for discipline. You know, you know our way into some discipline, yeah, yeah. Um, see, I'm having to work too hard to see this. Is this going to work better if I do it this way? Probably harder to hold, but... Um, Yeah, I do. I do think, though, uh, as you're saying, um, that if you have a teacher who's going to um, come into the room and say this should be a little wider, that should be that, you know, and with the whole idea of making correcting your eye, uh, it's a lot easier to do that um, that way. Especially with, when you're talking about the whole gamut, for example, and you're talking about getting color relations right and getting um, a, a chromal relations right uh, relationally. And all that sort of thing. So it's way easier to teach that. Um, that's say to, to to provide people with with a um, an objective eye, you know. And I think objective eye is what you're talking about. Um, so uh, you know, and and the question, I mean, YouTube and all the stuff we're doing with, on there. So that's really what it's got to be. Is there a value in a one-on-one -on -one relationship? And I've said to you before. I think the greater value, though, is that. Um, you're getting the whole body, shall we say, and the whole mind and the whole everything, you know, the arm movements. I mean, I don't, I'm just being silly, but, but the content that's there in a person is far greater than anything you're going to see on YouTube. The content that's there, not just in a demonstration, but I'm talking about when he's talking to you, when he's looking at your work and the things you go through in that process, uh, knowing that that other mind is going to be there. But if your idea is to get your head around, um, uh, the way this kind of th a particular kind of thinking, I don't know how you really do it. You can get your head around some aspects of it, but the deep stuff, I'm not sure. The whole complex, you know, the whole, the whole way it hangs together in all its complexity. Um, yeah, it's a, it's, it's, it's a question. It's one that you're going to simply have to solve. You can try. I hate to have you find out 40 years later it doesn't work. When you have, in the sense of working directly with somebody, you have a tried and true thing that's worked historically really well. So that's just the thought, yeah. Um, yeah, it depends on your professors are, and it also depends on whether they're confusing. A lot of people had difficulty working in the, in the academy, uh, you know, Julianne, uh, because of the uh, one teacher would come in and say, you're putting in too much color, and the next one would come in and say, take it, you know, add, some, uh, add, add color to that. Why aren't you seeing the colors? And, you know, and that's, you know, if you're talking about paintings guys are doing, um, uh, from life, and you're having critiques in which people are putting their own, you know, stylizations and ways of thinking, and and then I mean, and, and, and even even I can't even imagine that they use the same palette. You know, so that's got to be really confusing. Schools schools tend to be like that. The other reason, of course, not to do it through college is you got to waste way too much time not being not painting. You know, if you're if you're getting in a minimally four hours a day, you can you can make progress. Uh, even in a college, but uh, I prefer to tell students to, you know, work a 40-hour week as a painter, and if you want to take college classes, take them at, you know, take those online, take them in the evening somewhere else or whatever, and, you know, if you, to whatever extent you want it or can afford it, do it. Um, anyway. Uh, coffee's cold, but the sound is so much better. <laughs> Sorry. I thought my laptop's sound bad because it was low. Good work, Mr. Producer. There you are. I think a teacher is important for drawing accuracy. I think this is, Theodore, I think most of, of this, the academies are for developing that side. It's all about teaching accuracy. Yeah, it teaches a lot of other things. I was listening to John Gatto talk about the education, um, you know, modern education of students. He said people don't even some people don't even understand it, but what the first thing they teach you is respond to bell. The second one is respond to authorities. The third one is memorize facts. Well, I'm saying that in every place you study, like in the world of the academy, the idea that they sit you in front of a, of a bar drawing and, for, and you can sit there for a year or something trying to noodle up this one uh, silly copy, um, that stuff is like, like, what are they teaching? What does that tell you? What are you learning from that? 
So I'm just saying you can say that now. But the idea of painting what you see, if you're doing, then you can you can do if you're doing sight size, then you're going to learn some pernicious behaviors. If you're painting relationally, then you're going to be de developing good behaviors. You're going to be you know. I mean, and this is now me talking about where I'm coming from. Uh, but if the if if seeing is seeing relationally, then uh, and your and your and your and your mechanics is actually measure based instead of see based. Uh, then you'd be in trouble. I don't think most people actually prefer to wind up in the world of, of, of check, starting with measurements. I think uh, the, the gift of, of painting is in the pursuit of the, um, of the, uh, of the uh, thing uh, on its own complex terms and in, se in, in, in uh, what you would call it, you know, the three steps forward, two steps back sort of sequence where you, 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 you make a statement and you adjust a statement and all that sort of thing. Uh, I think the yeah, but I'm just picking on. I, I don't want to go in depth into that kind of stuff. Let's not do that. But you follow where I'm going, though. That the um, that there's can be a whole lot of baggage with all these different ways of working, and then the complexity of working with multiple people and that sort of thing. So if you said to me, "Do I think there is a body of knowledge that should be taught everywhere, like the science of light on an object?" That's one of those places where I'm simply going to say to you, "I don't even think you need a school for that." That's what you can get on YouTube. But that's a huge piece of what people are doing to you. They sit there and make you noodles, the color of light on an object. You know, uh, you know. I mean, the color of light, the uh, gradations of light, and and tell you that there's a shadow line, reflected light, and all those sorts of things. That's definitely book knowledge. Um, but putting it to use and drawing accurately, yeah, that that's that's true. You have to have somebody watching a little bit. You need the fresh eye. Oddly enough, it's amazing how you can lie to yourself when you're a young student and think you're doing well when you're not. I remember being off in drawings by an inch. I had. I used to say finally to myself, "This isn't about the truth anymore. This is just about honesty." <laughs> Can you get to this place where you tell the truth, you know, to yourself about how far off you are? And you know, but there's an objective eye, the need for an objective eye, and that's going back. And I'm going back and forth between the other things we've been talking about. Um, are we down to Ron? Ron, thank you for that contribution. Appreciate that very much. Uh, nice to see you again. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, I seem to miss your commentary of Renoir. I don't, <laughs> uh, uh, though it seems to me like he could be within your regards. Could you share your thoughts on his paintings? I think I've told you all before. I, I, when I was a kid, I read this book called, well, what was it called, My Father Renoir or something. It was, it, was, it was a Reader's Digest condensed version of something on Renoir. And that was my first uh, 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 sally into the romanticization of painting. And I hear I was just sort of in love with painting because of this guy, and I very quickly got over. I, I never, I never found him to be the, a guy that stuck, you know. He, and that's one of those things over time, you know. You can like Renoir, you can like all sorts of good painters, but over time, you're always looking to improve your taste, and improve. You're always looking for somebody who does it better in these various ways that you, you know, that you've eventually uh, begun to understood uh, through your own experience are best you know, are, are best, you know, and have the most of what you believe ought to be there. Renoir doesn't hold up as well to me. And the longer I watched him, the more I didn't, I didn't find him. He seems like a sort of an impressionist version of Boucher or something like that. And that's not very kind, but I don't think he was not trying to be straight and true. Even Cezanne and, and, and Van Gogh are trying to paint what they saw according to their own commentary. Uh, and then they wound up, of course, being examples um, you know, being used as excuses for doing stuff that's just uh, a little curious. But uh, yeah, I've never, I've never over time. So I've, I, I don't even look at him anymore. So I apologize to all you. Those you can judge me for that. <laughs> um, I, I, I guess that you'd say that you get over certain people, and uh, that was one that I started with. Now Michelangelo was one of the early ones too. I admired enormously, and I've never gotten over him. So. That's an interesting thing. Does your taste evolve and leave certain people behind? Does your knowledge of things evolve and does that leave people behind? Doesn't mean there aren't values in those people. I, that's why I say you never, I never throw anybody out. Degas said you can learn something from anybody. I never throw anybody out in any, any complete sense. I don't just throw people under the bus or throw them out. I just admit that there's less to be gained here. Uh, and over time, I don't get the visual enjoyment that I had before I knew anything. Um, is that jaded taste? That's a question, huh? Do you work with a limited palette, and what are some of your favorite pigments? I do, I do work with a limited palette. It's a, it's a five-color palette with black and white, 
in addition to that five, those five colors. That's my palette is very very simple. If you start at the at the uh, uh, top end, it's just ultramarine blue. I I don't particularly I'm not fussy about it, whether it's French ultramarine or whether it's ultramarine blue deep. Uh, probably blue deep is a, a better way to go. But but then I use. Um, and then go immediately to Viridian as the, as, as the, the green. And so you can see me moving through, as a, some people call it a, uh, a um, I call it a full spectrum palette, you know, where you're trying to get red, yellow, blue, you know, around as if you're going like a Munzel wheel. And, um, and so the next color is, is, is uh, cadmium yellow, a lemon, and followed by cadmium um, uh, scarlet. And then uh, the last of the reds, the dark red, is uh, al alizarin. I do use flake white, and um, you know I prefer lead whites and um, and ivory black. But it's a five. It's five colors, but they're real colors. It's not dead stuff like the old version of, of vermilion, for example. Uh, it's not like that. This is seriously intense stuff. But I found that I could mix any color, and for some reason I kept because I value the idea of of uh, of c color combinations that say actual pigmental combinations to make every color valuing the idea at least uh, as much as I as I m you know understood it over time of broken color and this idea of potential for vibration and that sort of thing so I do value those uh, the the mixing of colors and not the overmixing right but I find that I can mix any color I can and some and the adjustment process if you're doing it all over the whole entire field of painting, the adjustment process is fairly gets to be very fairly straightforward. That feel does give me a, 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 a what you call a warm blue and a cool blue. It gives me a warm yellow and a cool yeah. It does. Uh, I should say a warm yellow, but a how, depending how you think of these colors, you got to think of them outside the box. <laughs> Even though you're calling them colors, I mean I can look at green and call it warm blue, you know, and and, and Viridian kind of is. I will say this, though, for anybody who's thinking I'm going outdoors with those colors exclusively, I'm not. I do use uh, permanent green light outdoors, and uh, sometimes add other kinds of colors. And Severs blue, though, uh, every single time I'm, I go out, I don't go out without those colors. Uh, so, uh, but then it just that's only adding two colors to it. But I don't, uh, and I always tell students add add other colors as particularly as you need them. Certain kinds of flowers, roses, uh, it really pays off to use. <laughs> If you want the life and the intensity of those cold reds, you know it really pays off to use the uh, quinacridone um, type type cut family, and um, and I will use a cadmium yellow, you know, uh, light, which is much warmer than cadmium lemon, De but it depends on the purpose. So I'd I'd never exclude other colors. I just starting with Brackman, I used 19 colors. And, uh, and a certain number of them were earth colors. And with Gamble, I used, you know, I think a third of the colors were earth colors. And I, th they were eliminated faster than anything else. I found I just never used them. Uh, and at a certain point, I found they were pernicious because I would, tr I would suddenly see there's yellow ochre right there, and I'd paint yellow ochre. And it would just stick out like a goofy color because <laughs> it had never been, it hadn't been built by combinations. Uh, that's just me. Yeah, that's just me. Uh, but again, you're always after this thing about what are you looking for. I'm looking for the life in the color, and any color I happen to put down, I want to have for it to have that life, and I find that's the best way I can get it. So yeah, for what that's worth, yeah. Uh, Spain, there we go. Hey, that's a, are you a new name? I think you are, Hathor. Um, uh, is there some kind of longer program in your school? I've read about six-week workshops. Yeah, I, I teach full time, and you can start in my studio. Uh, you can start in my studio uh, uh, any any time. Uh, and my studio year is uh, September fifteenth to June fifteenth. But you can come to my studio any time and work full time with me. Uh, as I said, the thing I encourage if you you got to minimally work to be working at all. I, I expect people to work minimally tw twenty hours, twenty hours a week, and um, um, and then, but but yeah, that's there. Yeah, and then you can, uh, but, but but working way longer and all that sort of stuff. Uh, I do. I run a, a studio that uh, also is designed. You have to be there when I'm doing critiques on the days I'm doing critiques. But but it's designed for you to be in and out on your when you can be there. So if you have jobs and things like that, uh, so I call it a key club. But it's it's your studio, and uh, it's not like the classroom opens at such a time. We have class, and you go home. It's open for you anytime, and uh, the only time we don't use it much is at night. And I do sometimes, do the, even then, do uh, night classes, evening classes, but not, not in drawing and painting. It's being like composition and that sort of thing. 
So yeah, good question. I'm glad you asked that. Um, did I miss one up there? Um, oh yeah, we missed a few here. Ah, there's, hi, Billy McBride. Nice to see that name again. Do you work with Limit Palette? Uh, yeah, okay. All right, many artists have multiple talents. Do you play any music? <laughs> no, that's my great defect in life. The only other thing I do, and I've over time evolved an ability, a, my own personal version of an ability to write poetry. I've always loved that discipline. And, uh, but no, I've never, I, I, I mess with sculpture. And, uh, but music, boy, I and music are not, we don't know anything about each other. I don't even, you know, I, I'm kind of, maybe I guess, suppose I shouldn't be. I enjoy music when I hear it, but I don't go looking for it. Never been that guy. And if I have it on the studio or something like that, I suddenly have to shut it off. It just, you know, it turns into like, ah, too much, too much. It's, I don't think I can take all, you know, the auditory simultaneously with the visual, uh, even with a slight hoot. So, uh, yeah. Um, Yeah, so let me see, uh, who did I just skip? I think I was about to skip somebody. Many artists have multiple talents, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'd love to be flatter you that way, and it's true, Sargent and, uh, and Ang too, I think Ang did the violin, uh, had an interesting background, um, yeah. No, I think it would be a value to have that. I would never tell anybody not to have a good, uh, a more rounded background than I did. The only thing I can remember is my, my sister and maybe another brother were taking piano lessons. I just remember the torture my folks put them through. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and making them do this practicing stuff, and, and there were tears coming down. I thought, you know, I think when it comes to music stuff, I'm going to lay low. I'm going to hide somewhere. So, you know, but that's not a very good thing to say. But I do actually. I love. I love music. I love Beethoven's. You know, uh, Ninth and uh, any number of realist, amazing stuff out there. What's well, not to love, right? I'm not a big fan of the new mu stuff. I don't find music in a lot of the new stuff that I hear, but. Um, even though I do still get a kick out of um, uh, Bob Dylan. Uh, so let's see, then uh, some other way you find it. Then could you get that same critical view some other way, or could finding other artists to work with be just as beneficial? That's probably a, one of the better fallbacks, yeah, if you were trying to get yourself, you know, some sort of a fresh eye, you know, if you can find people that are, you know, find some dominating personalities and stuff, just give this open, open minded, open handed, you know, uh, um, conversation back and forth, uh, you know, have a look from time to time at another person's work, if you're working in the same studio or whatever, and, and, and just give somebody a fresher high. Yeah, that's one of the better things. The one thing that people don't understand today, I think, is that the body of, and one of the reasons I even do videos, is that this body of knowledge is, is an incorporative one. It's all part of something bigger. And for, you know, I, I don't even, you know, it's like, how do you explain that value? You know what I mean? It's, most of us keep thinking of painting as a craft in this very limited sense of it's paint and you do stuff and you make it look like this. And it's kind of an interesting question, you know, of, you know, how much more there is to the being human, you know? So the association with somebody who's skillful, like it used to be that you'd work, uh, to become a lawyer or something, you'd work with a lawyer, you know, you wouldn't go to school and learn stuff and get turn, this all, turn the whole thing into a mechanics process sort of thing. Uh, so you do wonder about that, you know, and the passing on, like in the case of a lawyer, do you pass on even moral uh, wisdom, you know, stuff about what it means to be a good lawyer in the sense of the value good as opposed to be doing, it, doing it well. But yeah, there's so much that comes through. And I keep thinking, you know, that idea of the mind of Christ, the mind of, uh, but the mind of, uh, you know, I was looking for the, what is that mind of, that is this, that lays behind this entire thing? And that's a, yeah. As I said, I, I didn't want, you know, I, you know, I prayed for a good teacher. <laughs> I didn't want to be this guy, a self-taught guy who was deceiving myself the whole rest of my natural life. And even the good painters, the guys, some of the guys I said with in New York, I know they would, there are things they don't know because of that body of knowledge that wasn't that whole, uh, you know, leaning on somebody who was solid in every way and had this whole conversation. So um, I see that in a number of the names you would know of people from my generation. Uh, there are certain benefits. Uh, you know, and undoubtedly you can find stuff in that I don't know, so I'm not putting myself up there. I'm just simply saying I found these, which I'm so thankful for the value of having spent this personal time uh, hearing the conversation that went well into other stuff that had to do with the 
people that you knew, the painters you knew, and all sorts of things that are that are part of you know the lore is bigger than just uh, the technique, you know. But it's become that now, you know. Get a book about the technique and go from there. You know. Uh, so let's get back to who are we talking about? Um, Spain, other series. Yeah, the longer program. We talked about that. So what's the best way to help support and contribute to your public forum? I would like to send my patronage, though the inspiration seems priceless. I'm, I really appreciate that tattoo. Uh, the best way to do it is, uh, is there's a PayPal list there. Uh, Mr. Producer, you have words for that? Or could you pop it up or something like that? A place to punch the, the PayPal button. The donate? Yeah. Where would they see that from time to time? It's on the screen right now. It's on the screen right now. There you go. <laughs> Thank you. And but when they're going in general, when we do videos and stuff, there's a place there as well. You see, I don't follow this like I should. But is there a place there as well, to Mr. Uh, producer, that where they would? There's a uh, super chat people could use right now. Is that? Yeah, right now. Is that the same thing we do use on a regular yeah, basis? Okay, yeah, okay, so Ron did that already. So that's in the super chat. I, I, would, not, I would not be able to follow what I'm saying to you. <laughs> so I'm hoping you can follow. Uh, if you want to type anything on the screen, uh, Mr. Producer. And, oh, there you did, thank you. Yeah, yeah, okay, there it is. Uh, thank you very much for that tattoo, I appreciate it. Yeah, we're, 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 we're holding on. We're, right now we're sort of breaking even, and, uh, but, but beyond that, it would, it would be nice. It would be nice to be for us. We're trying to do some things that are, gonna, that are costing us more. This one does. And, and yeah, yeah, and, but in fact, what you guys did help me to is I now have a computer with much better resolution. Mine was starting to fail on me. And I had uh, start borrowing my wife's, for, <laughs> my wife's computer for certain things. <laughs> That, but that actually is from your contribution, so thank you very much for that. Um, yeah, hi Sandra, very nice to hear that. <laughs> see that, see that name there. Yeah. Uh, any relationship between uh, New England painting schools, groups, Boston School, aristocracy, Freemasonry, the archaeology? I hope not. Uh, my atelier teacher is in the Bohemian. Gee, where are you? Is that Jocko? Are you in California? Did you say? Yeah. Oof. Bohemian Grove, that doesn't have a great reputation. No, not a thing, no. <laughs> now, and Gamble himself, I did have a student whose father had apparently been involved out there and done some funny stuff, but I'd, I've always been a total shock at the stuff that I read and see about that stuff. No, I don't thank you very much. No, I have nothing to do with that. Gamble had nothing to do with any of those things. Gamble was a member of clubs, like the Tavern Club and the St. Patolf Club and the, maybe the Union or the Summer Club or whatever, Summer, Summer? No, but, but the Union Club, but minimally. And some other New York ones. There's a member of the New York, uh, um, the National, what is it, the National Arts Club in New York and stuff like that. But no, it's just strictly related to that sort of thing. I never have heard of any such thing from any of our guys, and it seems like the most unlikely thing ever, but no. And, um, and Gamble certainly has never mentioned any such things in his biographies of Paxton or himself, autobiography of himself. I just, by the way, found an autobiography of Gamble that I totally forgotten exists. It's full of all sorts of really good essays. I'm going to see if I can find some way to get an online version for you all to look at, and you'll have more of that information. But no, no, I hope not, uh, uh, Jocko. It's a shocking discussion, actually. These days, it's a very serious problem. Uh, what in the heck is happening with us and what, you know, the world out there is what's, what's, what's going on? I see I've been blocking my own face here. I better quit doing that. Um, Count Furioso, there you go. Well, thank you so much for your work. Could you elaborate a bit on Gamel's method of using models for his imaginative work? To what extent did he paint by, uh-oh, what is VO? Greetings from Germany. Would you tell me what VO is and remind me to come back to this question? Gam oh, VO. <laughs> okay, all right. Oh, even my own stuff, I don't have, oh man, I have never been a friend of the, what is that called, an acronym? Oh my golly, thanks, uh, thanks uh, Mr. Producer. <laughs> you can tell Mr. Producer is 30 years younger than me or more. <laughs> all right. Um, Gamel's method of using models for his imaginative work. Well, Gamel would actually, you know, hire a model. He would have built the entire apparatus that he needed so the people would be standing on the right levels. Then he would do drawings of them. He would transfer the drawings and he'd paint on the transferred drawings. That was the process. So, and I think you'll see that in most of what the, um, uh, you know, traditional imaginative painters have done. Even illustrators do things rather like, like that. But Gamel always, 
to my knowledge, he always painted from life. He always had models. One of the reasons he said, you, you know, you, you probably can't be painting my kind of pictures is because you, you're not rich enough. <laughs> you can't hire the models and, and hire this guy to build props for you. And he had, a, he had a guy that was doing gold leafing and faux stuff, and he would make wooden keys, you know, like so the guy could hold a big key. I mean, you know, a bunch of these props are around, not my studio, I wish I still had a couple of them, but they were around. I do have one, I have a temple, a Greek temple, that would come all apart, and uh, so Gamble would use those things, small versions of things like that as models. But yeah, that one, uh, let's see if I could better get through that faster. Uh, did he, but painting by the visual order, I never saw any evidence that Gamble did understand the Boston School that well, well enough to, to have done that. He appreciated the visual order, but he didn't paint from it. What I mean to say is it, it was clear that he believed the relationship of things had to be right to each other. But we were never taught anything from him directly about when we're laying in a painting to study the relationships of the powerful effects in relation to others. Nothing like Max Meldrum does and, I, and what I do. So no, I'd say that isn't where I got any of that. He's more much more like Paxton than he is like DeCamp, uh, Tarbell, or Benson. And you should look at those kinds of guys sort of side by side and see the difference. Uh, but yeah, Gamble's imaginative painting doesn't have quite the same level of need for that. But yeah, it doesn't show up. But yeah, but if you ask about his teaching, no, he didn't teach it. No, none of the, none of the phraseology, any of that stuff I use. Well, he said things, I mean, I think, I'm pretty sure he said things like paintings if you're coming out of a fog, but he didn't even, even begin to mean what, what I do, you know, what the Boston School did. I, but I got, you know, I want to be very careful because I'm not sure he said that as much as he put reading in front of us and I read everything. And so I was learning these other word phrases and stuff probably from other sources. But I remember thinking, I don't, you know, he would say, like I'd mentioned before about edges, I would, I, I said to him at one point, he would draw an outlines, filled it all in. And I said, when do you do the edges? And he said, oh, well, you can always patch up the edges, you know, and I asked him who to look at for that. And I went to see, and he sent me to Chardin, who I saw incorporate, painted edges incorporatively. And Chardin is a really good example of a guy who became more and more visual over time and painted. There's a, there's a what we call painterly painting as <clears throat> the way we paint, the way we see and the way we think in terms of visual art sort of forces that kind of visual uh, painterly painting, it forces it on you. Uh, it's part of the process. I better not say more about that. I won't be able to get anybody else in, but uh, yeah, nice to have met you there. Uh, Count Furioso, <laughs> I like that. I uh, really appreciate you spending time sharing your websites under construction. Is that right, Mr. Producer? I will check back for donation. Don't have GPay set up like Ron did here. Yeah, thank you for that, though. Appreciate hearing from that, Lejeune. Uh, is it possible to share your class critiques on YouTube? Class critiques. Now, I don't have class critiques, but I walk around critiquing work here, suggesting I might want to, want, might want to um, 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 have somebody shoot a video of me critiquing somebody. I did have one student who would, from time to time, ask me if, I, if he could leave his camera running while I did a critique. If that's what you mean, let me know, because I wouldn't be opposed to that, and I'd probably do it if you asked me. Um, my class critique, but I don't do class critiques per se. I do critique one person at a time. Uh, hi, Paul. Greetings from Brazil. Um, congratulations for 4,000 subs and for a great job. Yeah, that is uh, something we've, that's really been, a, I just learned that today myself. That is really something I'm really, really pleased to be able to reach that many. I think I told all of you guys at one point, my, I had this, I woke up like in a stupor, I was teaching 25 students at that time on my own, it was killing me. I, it really wasn't a place I could live. I had to get down to 12 to 18. And so for a long time I was at 18, but it was still tough, 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 tough thing to do. And, um, uh, I, but I had this dream one night, there was a number, it was 600. And I knew it was meant students. And I thought, there's no way in the world I'm teaching 600 students, that's insane. And I remember the day we got to 600 uh, viewers on, YouTube. That number was made, uh, it, was, it was an aerial figure that I'd had in my dream. Well, who, who dreams in aerial figures in the first place? But there was this number 600 and it was exactly the same figure. So it was a fascinating, it's a fascinating thing, you know. Um, but no, so it is very pleasing to be able to reach uh, so many people. That, yeah, yeah. Um, and I do hope that there's, whatever benefit I'm, you know, to the extent there are gaps and things, let me know. Do ask questions. I mean, get them off to me so that 
it's not this thing where it's, it's fun to do or romantic to do. Is make sure it's a benefit. You know, let's, let's make make sure we figure that out together. Um, yeah, yeah. Thank you for that, though. I'm sure you mentioned this in one of your videos, but I have might have missed it. How do you evaluate the value of colors? Drawing in pencil. Um, I don't. Yeah, and, and maybe it's that I don't know what you mean. You have to learn to see the world uh, of color as pure value. And one of the ways that you can do that, by blurring your eyes, for example, you knock the crap out of color, so to speak. <laughs> you uh, Blurring the eyes, one of the benefits, uh, one of the benefits, I mean, is that you can't see color with a hoot. But um, no, values exist on their own. You have to, by trial and error, you have to just simply learn to, for example, red is a very difficult color to understand. But if you're doing pencil drawings, now if you're talking about noodling them up like, like a charcoal drawing, you will find that when you get the values right, it'll actually start taking on this look like it's red, if it's say, say in that red spot. I have found that to be the case, but I've never found any great tricks to doing that. I think what, I've, what I have found is that you, you base things on contrast. And it's very difficult. Sometimes people will see a red hitting a blue, and they will assume a value difference. And all you have to do is blur your eyes. And if you can't see a silhouette, silhouettes imply value contrast. If you can't see a silhouette, you know it doesn't have one. And that's, there's a number of ways like that where you can sort of stop yourself from getting faked out. But, but contrast is the key to values, right? As I say, the relative amount of contrast. That's what Lost and Found is about. There's places where there's no contrast and you don't get silhouettes, places you get high contrast. And there are places where you get middle contrast and that's where visual order comes in. The high contrast stuff, which are the easiest ones just projecting towards your eyes. They're the keys to the, your lightest lights and darkest darks and setting up that whole thing. So, uh, but values is the key. And so when you're in drawing, you're not in color. And you need, like in all other areas, you need to be able to separate chroma from values. You have to be able to say, I think I have a chroma problem, an intensity problem here. Now, you could say, now are my values right? Is my hue right? And, uh, and if those things appear to be right, then intensity comes in. But in some ways, they're, of course, they're always coming they're coming at you together, so you need the right intensity of the right color at the right value, you know what I mean? So, um, yeah, yeah, I think I, that gets it going anyway, doesn't it? Um, yeah, you did mention charcoal in that one, didn't you? What master teach artist do you tend to search out when you visit a good art museum? Yeah, I, actually, I don't do that. I just, when I go to an art museum I've never seen before, I just walk around, you know, stupidly like everybody else, but I never, I never go around and look at every single picture. I do take that long view. I stand back and look. And if you're asking that, Sandra, you know the answer, don't you? <laughs> but the question, I, what I do is I walk into every room, and if, um, if I can get myself in a position in the middle of the room, I'll, well, typically what I do is I walk through the museum just to see what they've got, right? And certain pictures will come to me, and if I've never seen such and such by Degas, and I've always been interested in that, I've, you know, those are the things that will attract me. Particularly, there are guys like that, but I don't go, I actually don't go looking for anybody in particular unless I'm in their museum, you know. Um, you know, if you're in a museum that's dedicated to Pleisner, of course you're going there to see Pleisner, but no, I just, but, but the second thing I do that I started to talk about was, um, after I stand in the middle of the room and I then want to know which picture to look at, and I just look around and see which one draws me, and I want to know, I'm interested in that process, that phenomena. And then I'll go back and look again, but or else I'll just walk by pictures and wait for one to talk to me, you know. But I don't, I don't think I go in with agendas. I mean, I can go in with agendas if I'm looking for something like like I want to see a better, I want to see some better paint handling. I would when I was a student in particular, I would go and just look at lots of pictures like stupidly to see if anybody. And I have found a number of really what you'd call second-rate painters who really did some beautiful things with paint handling, you know edges and pink viscosity and stuff was very impressive. But yeah, I don't think I've ever taken that position otherwise, yeah. Uh, have you ever tried to combine your art with your poetry? You know, <laughs> it's a funny thing. We did an um, imaginative thing, the students did, for an exercise, and uh, it was a figure. It was a figure. Uh, uh, we decided it was the figure of, 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 of a, ri be a river, say a river goddess or something like that. And then I went and looked up uh, I was reading, I think I was reading Milton, and I found this poem called Comos, I think it was called. But it was about this river goddess, and the beautiful thing about it was the poetry, the, the, the quality, the, 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 uh, the rhythms and such 
had that same lyric quality as what we were trying to get into the painting. That lyric, I do mean to say the, that sense of flow and that sense of, lyric's the wrong word actually for that, but, but I mean the, um, the uh, um, let's just leave it at that, the sense of the, sense of the way the lines flowed and, the, and it produ produced a sense of the, f of, of the flowing of water, for example. And I'd found the set painter had done the same, the poet had done the same thing. So, yeah, I've never have otherwise, though. No, and yeah, if I was, yeah, that's too complex for me. I'm <laughs> not that guy. Um, um, hey, take care, Theodora. Yeah, thanks for, thanks for being here. Jack, nice to meet you. Jack Tier. have you ever tried to combine? That was your question, okay. Jovan, how often do you think or not is painting reacting intuitively? Whoa, whoa, whoa. How often do you think, or not, is painting reacting intuitively right, true, and valuable? Intuitively to what you see, of course. Um, huh. I, what I do, I, this is a hard one, I don't know exactly what you mean, so you might try again on that one, but when I, when I, what I'm talking about painting, I'm, everything I do is intuitive, right? That is to say, Intuitively, I'm looking for the, even the idea of the backstraggler. To me, I just look at the thing as a whole and don't have plans about which one it's going to be. I just let myself find it, let it, just, let it just show up. Now, that's not what you mean by intuition, probably. But, um, you know, even the pursuit of a teacher, that was all intuitive. You don't know anything as a student. You don't know a dang thing. You know, and just, you, I, all I could do is look at things and think, that's not it, that's not it, that's not it, right? What is that? Except maybe your intuition. But... Um, I think of everything I do as being rather, you know, in painting as being all based on my eyes and my feeling, my sensation, my, 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 you know, I consider that the connection, my feelings. So if that's what you mean by intuition, yeah, it's virtually everything, but, but then I apply science. In other words, I may see how this feels and want to express that, but I have to say, so what's causing that to happen? And I'll have to be able to say in relation to what, you know, and that's, that's where you use your brain. So then you're, you know, so then you're saying in relation to this, in relation to that, in relation to that, and even when to use that is an intuitive thing. But, but, but you do have to have that combination. So don't confuse those or conflate those two things. There is a need to, I think it was somebody said, Millet said about uh, Rembrandt, he said, he, when I'm out of, I'm sorry, he said, when I stop thinking, I stop painting. And the idea of being out of your mind to be a painter, which is another one of those conversations, I think maybe Stevens or somebody, uh, those are both there in painting all the time. But when I stop thinking, I stop painting. I mean, that's a huge comment. So, you know, so how much is intuition involved in all that stuff? I'd, I better not go better without understanding that because there are other questions here. So if you can put that down differently and maybe better as we go along uh, or more, more getting it more precisely to where you want it to be, uh, just let me know. After you finish a painting, do you spend, if you like a great amount of time looking at it? No, actually I don't. Um, that's one of those things, uh, that's, that's interesting. I, d I had a, at one point because of the stupid things I would do, I found this, I found this cartoon in New Yorker or something. There was a car big sort of a fattish painter sitting there with his brushes sort of in his hand. And, but he was sitting there eating popcorn, looking at his painting. And I used to do that and I would try to be trying to figure it out or else, and then I'd find myself falling in love with it. And all it would do is make the next day a horrible experience in painting. So I just stopped having anything to do with what, you know, looking at my paintings. Now, it, I've already been in it long enough to know where the defects are and what I'm going to do in the next one and that sort of thing. So I don't necessarily need to do that. But I would never tell somebody not, though, to look at their work and think it through. If there's something that they need to do better or something, I'm still not, you know, look at your work, keep your eye on it, and keep wondering if you can be a better painter. And what is, where are you now at this point in your painting? Uh, Gamel's thing when he was talking to us was he would say, you paint pictures and then put them on the floor in chronological order and look at them and see how you're doing. And I find more benefit in seeing several pieces over time, and I can see that I'm I haven't solved such and such. It starts becoming more evident I haven't solved such and such a problem. But there might be other good reasons to do what you're suggesting, but I don't sit around staring at my pictures and patting myself on the back. I can find you can injure, your, injure yourself that way. <laughs> okay, oh, oh, there's a few more, good. Um, uh, Jovan, exactly what I wanted to hear. Okay, 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 good. Have you ever, says Richard, uh, thanks Richard, have you ever seen videos of the South Korean illustrator Kim, I have not, no, drawing out of his head. 
Yeah, yeah. I'll see if I can look that up. Kim Kim Jong Ji. That that that's, that'd be very interesting. Uh, that's not a. I mean, the truth is, if I was if I would had been focused on imaginative painting, I would clearly have sat down there and become that guy, so to speak. The ability to create your own figure. The you know what Millet did and. Michelangelo and uh, significant parts of that past um, way of thinking, I would definitely become that guy, you know. And even from time to time, I sit around just drawing figures out of my head. I do paint figures out of my head. I do have paintings. I have several on the palette right pa right now that are out of my head, um, uh, and so I continually work at that problem. So it's it's an interesting thing. But I know I'd like to see this guy's work, and I'd like to. See, there are a number of people you find in history that you should look at, though. Uh, beyond those two that I've mentioned, who else? Some of you may be able to think of some, but there are definitely quite a number of guys who could do really effective work out of their heads. Of course, Rubens would pro undoubtedly been one of those guys. I don't know. I doubt. I'm betting in a bunch of those things he did, he wasn't using models. Um, yeah. Yep. Uh, do you have Do you have paintings that require the most? time painting, not because the size of the canvas are difficult technique, but because of the gestation of idea. Yeah, that, that I find in, um, in, in imaginative painting is always the case. I mean, I can, <laughs> as my producer knows, I've had one painting that I, that I started 40 years <laughs> ago, probably, and I just keep messing with it, you know. It doesn't solve itself quickly. But, uh, and I know that I've read stories about, and I find the same thing to be true, the painters that are, that are working on paintings over five years and so on, uh, that they will have them leaning against the wall, maybe sometimes visible, sometimes not, sometimes turn them around and, and be looking at them and then have an idea. And I've been that guy, when it comes to imaginative painting, I don't know how to hurry that stuff along yet. Maybe there is such a way to do it, but I like the gestation model. I do think that's a, for imaginative painter, I think that's a pretty big deal. I don't find that that has any application in, in, in the world of, of, of actual, you know, painting from life in the Impressionist sense. Uh, no, not at all, yeah. <coughs> now, having said that, I should say that when I go out to paint an imaginative landscape, I mean an Impressionist landscape, I do do a small study, you know, smaller than this. And those things I then, I don't blow them up, but I do have time to think that through and th think about how the composition might be changed, might be improved and so that sort of thing. So I do get that kind of separation. But typically you're in a situation like in the fall when I'm painting some of those, the weather's changing. You know, the, not the weather, but the, uh, you know, all the trees are gonna be barren and that sort of thing. So the idea of going out there and taking your larger canvas out there and executing is usually in, you're in the category of you better keep moving, get, get it moving and <laughs> get it done and, and so on, you know. And hopefully you can get out of the second or third day uh, before the weather's, before everything's lost. But, so those aren't the same kind of gestation though. It's a different model. Just a little bit of it at the very beginning. Which I, I think I always do, yeah. All right. Do you have paintings that require the most time painting? Yeah, but that would be it. Those are the ones. What subject would you recommend painting purely for the sake of improving technical ability and providing important problems to solve? Actually, that's the still life. There's no question about that. When you have J uh, Reynolds or Joshua Reynolds teach, telling his student body that that a person who can paint a still life can paint anything, I mean that's a big deal. You gotta you gotta listen to that guy and um, and that thought. And I found it to be so. I simply found it to be so. The, the great issue with different, you know, I so I spend three years with the art students like and painting the figure and portrait every day, but I never learned a thing about composition. Never had to piece anything together. Never had, had, had even come up with selections of objects that be thrown in front of you, painted, and there's all this th thing you have to do to it that makes it art. Uh, that's not in the same class of picture making as when, and, and so with picture making being one of those things you need to learn. But the complexity of the problem of painting objects floating in space, just like a portrait head, um, versus having a, an object in front of an object in front of another object, all in a fairly complex environment, you know. That gets you to where the, all the problems are related to all aspects of painting. Like even if you're going to do imaginative painting with lots of figures, that this is where you can learn that, and you can s slow everything down, slow the process down. But yeah, I'd say the still life by Miles. Yeah, and of course you can apply that in a way. If you say interiors, as long as things aren't going to change, an interior is the same as a it's just a blown up still life, so to speak. You know what I mean? 
Um, yeah, so that is it. And so uh, subject-wise, though, I don't have that if you mean subject meaning, should I paint a white vase or a, no. But what you should do in still life is you should paint a nice variety of things that create a variety of silhouettes and, and curious things in combination that get you out of the object and into the shape world, you know, the, into the intrigue of interplay of, of shape, which is only seen when you have contrast, right, and levels of contrast and all those sorts of things. Create a nice variety in whatever you set up. And, you know, and I always tell people, students, too, to find, a color, find colors that just go together and look magical together. And, you know, you'll have the patience to stay with the painting longer. Uh, if you already like that little aspect of it. Um, yeah, I always use a high quality support. I, I wouldn't say that, you know, you, boards, I paint on canvas boards, and I think that's a reasonable quality support. I've seen them, they've lasted for 100 years and look fine, you know. So if we at least have that adequate level of, you know, a decent, a decent canvas on it and that sort of thing, um, they should be fine. But I don't paint on junk. I don't use poor linen. I don't use uh, poor cotton. I mean, I, don't, I avoid those. Some cottons are okay. But I try to avoid that um, uh, cheap junk. I think the model you want to have is, well, you, is, is, is to take the painting seriously at all time. And if you're not using serious products to, you know, if you're not painting with good quality paint, you're not going to do well. If you're not using good brushes, you're not going to do well. But the thing you're painting on will affect your ability to take what you're doing seriously. Take yourself seriously. You know what I'm saying? So that's a, fu that's a fascinating question, yeah. Um, do I, sometimes I do ex experimental or practice pieces on cheap or unprepared surfaces, but they end up being better, <laughs> better than a planned painting. Yeah, and that's a bit of a tragedy if it's going to simply fall off the wall, isn't it? Yeah. But, um, yeah, hopefully you'll get past that, though, Jim. Uh, the, uh, you know, I mean, in other words, planned paintings, uh, there, lots of little accidents happen to painting, but it's the, you don't want to believe in luck. You want to actually live at a really high level on a regular basis. So that uh, your, the, the materials you use should always be on that level too because everything you produce is going to have value. And that's where you, you want to get to that. Don't think of painting as this sort of spontaneous inspired thing that every once in a while you knock one off and the rest of the time you're sort of like in tragedy, you know. That's, that's an interesting question about trying to get yourself a professional standard, you know, to be able to produce whatever it is you've been assigned to produce, you know. Um, I say that meaning the Paxton model, you know, uh, you hang a sign on your door, it says painter, it means that you can do whatever is required. But you also mean that you can do whatever is required and they're not going to knock on your door if it doesn't, they don't see high quality in each thing you do. And that the product doesn't fall apart over time, you know, and they're not sweeping up, you know, paint from under your paintings <laughs> at the museum in theory if you made it. Um, uh, let's see, where were we? Do you Subject meaning uh, still life portrait. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we got that right. Good. Um, uh, do you always paint on a high quality support? Sometimes it was okay. And if you ever feel interested in abstraction and surrealism combined, I definitely recommend Miodrag Dado Jurek. There's a virtual museum website of his work. Um, yeah, yeah, the, yeah. The, I, you know. I don't go hunting hunting for variety. I'm not. I've never been one of these curiosity seekers or anything like that. But uh, but people have done a lot of interesting things in, with with our medium. And uh, I don't. You know, I enjoy the, the the range of stuff as much as anybody does. Uh, would be interested in hearing thoughts on uncommon artists. <laughs> uncommon artists. I'm gonna have to think about that one. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think um, uncommon, uncommon. You know, one thing if you're, I don't know where you're from, but if you, you might just be looking at your own culture, if you'll find some people in your own culture that are like illustrious and unknown, you know, that's one of those things. When I found this book by Jackman on American painting, uh, I uh, was stunned at how much I didn't, hadn't seen before. Really good quality stuff that I just never, ever knew was out there. And that's a book, you might be able to find that kind of a book, uh, but that's a book that covers everybody. And they weren't doing any selling. And Boston School actually wasn't particularly looking good. And if I remember right, I don't remember who was in there, but I think maybe all of these guys were in there. And, uh, and uh, but it wasn't the Boston School, it was all kinds of people, you know. That's why you hear me mentioning Vinton and Vana and, uh, you know, and, and they're the, the, the Redfields and the whole world of the, uh, of the, um, 
of the uh, what do you call it, the Pennsylvania Impressionists, and um, but that's a that's that, that's a, I, I recommend to everybody if you want to look for something maybe more less than less common. I mean, who's ever heard of in America? If you're American, who has ever heard of uh, of Blashfield, the, uh, a muralist named Blashfield? But that would be a place to start. But one of the things I really appreciated about Gamma was that range of people we ran into, and that's again one of those things. You know, if you're working with somebody directly, you'll typically, there'll be all sorts, you'll start picking up a whole range of painters that you'll never have run into before. Um, yeah, there are numbers of them, but I think your experience uh, over time, you're gonna, life is interesting. There's enough out there that right now with the video visual, uh, internet available, you can always find more. I mean, one of the surprises to me was somebody that I, I'm not gonna tell you to paint like this person, Lempica. But an Art Deco painter, but I've always gotten a cheap thrill out of her stuff. I've really liked it. I really like something about that, that heavy-handed form mannerism that she does. And if that's a name you hadn't seen, uh, but yeah, depends on where you're looking. But if you keep looking at the same sources like the art histories, they all they all they have this tendency to grab all the same painters, and they'll leave out all the same painters. So just read between the lines. Go look at better books than you know than the ones that are the standards in the schools. Um, okay, that, that, okay. Is gesture drawing part of your lay-ins? Uh, how do you get energy and movement into a figure? Do you rely on the observation of light effects for this? Yeah, I do. I do, Chris, Chris, Chris Trap, Chris Trapeniers. I bet that's a combination. Uh, of other things that I'm never going to be able to figure out. But Chris, yeah, uh, I don't do gesture drawing. I didn't, I, I, we did all that stuff at the Art Students League. And, uh, and I, and I um, but in painting, I'd never found it valuable <laughs> to put a bunch of crap on my painting and then try to find my way through. I always found, well, I've found since then, I can get all the life in the world out of in anything I'm doing. Uh, I don't even do it, by the way, with, um, now this, this is an interesting question. When you say when you say gesture, it's no question. If I'm doing an imaginative figure, the first thing I'm after is the gesture, but I still do it with outlines. So it depends on what you mean by it. If you mean scribbles and, and scrawling around, sort of trying to get this general movement of some junk, I'm not going to tell you not to do it. But I, I'm saying that I what I do is I I, I make uh, 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 I'm after the gesture of the figure, but I make it out of lines. The the, the lines. That I've seen that I so when I've ultimately when I studied drawing at my I did start, followed the sergeant model of drawing along lines and I tried to over time you're memorizing things that are predictable knowable you know but no I do that and and so yeah if you're asking that I think that's the right answer to the question not when I'm doing painting from life though but when I'm painting when I'm painting from life I draw what I see the I found all the advantages are in, in just and if you watch my video uh, where I'm doing the nude as a demonstration, the standing woman, you'll see how I approach it. Uh, but the, getting the life in the gesture is absolutely as crucial as anything else. Anytime you're doing a shape, the gesture is this huge thing. And it has nothing to do with it being a figure, a person doing a gesture. Value units have gesture. And complex ones have gesture. You know, so it's not a figure. It's, that's the, the word gesture doesn't tie to that. It ties to everything. So if you have a grouping of, 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 uh, of, of roses or of chrysanthemums or something and they're piled up and they make a certain abstraction, that abstraction has a gesture to it. And you understand that. In all painting, your entire, your entire painting itself has its own gesture. That's what we call the main line. Uh, so have that in mind when you're thinking about this. Don't limit it. Yeah, I got it carried away on that one. That's a fun question. Um, uh, is, could you explain the concept shadows are flat again? Uh, shadows are flat, yeah. Um, what it boils down, so the, there was an aphorism Gamel gave us that said, shadows are flat, as flat as a hat. Why, they're flatter than the hat. <laughs> that, was, that was Gamel's way of making it memorable. I don't know if he learned that from anybody. I think he made that kind of stuff up. But, but the other one was, shadows are flat, and then there was a semicolon, the form is in the lights. And uh, so, um, the flatness versus the form idea, right? The, the idea of flatness, that flatness, I tell you that flatness is a form, right? <laughs> you know, if you see the wall behind me, 
you'd say flat and you mean not round, right? It's, the, it's like the antiform or it's the other end of form, it's flatness. So, uh, but what we, but, but there's two different things we do. The shadow flat is one thing, right? And that's where you simply take all the values out of it. And if you guys will do this, if you're messing around trying to figure this out, draw an outline, put, set up a, a cast or whatever you have in, uh, in, a, in a nice, you know, two thirds front lit light, you know, where the light's mostly on it, but there's a good shadow line. And then block in the outline, mask the major values, find the shadow line, mask that value, and just get those values right in relation to each other and just look at it because there, there is a world without form and you'll see the flat shadows already look like they have atmosphere. And then what's gonna happen is when you start doing the form in the lights, the, you know, the, 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 the forms are gonna get rounder and rounder and rounder and rounder, but the shadows are gonna stay. We, we, we took the model, and this is a purely Boston School visual impression model, although I was probably taught by other groups, by, in, in other, in other uh, uh, schools. Um, but we took the model that because visually what's in the shadows is way weak, it's not important for a very, very long time. So flat is the default good position. But the fact is the more stuff, and even Da Vinci talks about having shadows having, what did he say? Uh, he talks about the, the uh, obscureness and the lack of sharp edges and things like that, the tendency for it to go vague. Um, all those things, it's all about the, you know, the, the low contrast, the contrast is so low in there and um, that um, it will tend to be right with no values at all for a very, very long time. And by the time you get into very nuanced areas of the, of the, of the form where, the, where you're barely working with almost invisible marks and still turning form, at some point along there you'll see that, hey, the shadows are saying, hey, but look at me, right? And then you're in purely visual order, that's what's happening. There's strong effects, high contrast, big, you know, dr dr dramatic uh, movements from dark to light. Those are the strong forms that'll come to your eye flying. Y you know, typically the way we set up too, by the way, you can set up with harsh counter lights and then you'll have to deal with both of them at the same time or more at the same time. Some of the Orpin stuff is like that if you haven't seen his work. But what, a shot, what we mean by it is not, no values, that's all, nothing more than that. Now, then there's the next piece of it, and that is that when you're thinking about painting, when you're painting from life, the world is three-dimensional, goes in every which direction. And we have learned that we must paint the world as if it were seen, as if it were already a painting. In other words, as if it were already flat. And that's a different model that we can talk about some other time. But, and it's also on my stuff. You can find those conversations on my, uh, on my videos. How are we doing for time? Are we okay? We're at a little over two hours. Great, um, great. Well, I'm going to stop in a few uh, soon. So, because I got a call coming in from somebody uh, that I have to see. You're yeah, Mr. Producer. <laughs> I'm talking to these guys. So, uh, <laughs> so we're going to we're gonna have to quit. We're going to have to stop. Um, I don't know what we guaranteed. Did we talk about two hour show? Was that what we we're trying to do? That's what we usually decide. We do about two hours. Yeah, yeah. Well, you guys good. I hope if I disappear pretty soon, I actually did invite somebody. I completely f lost track of what we do. I thought we were doing an hour and a half, and <laughs> it's two hours to be stretching it, but. I hope you've enjoyed this. Uh, let me, I'm going to do the last the questions that are left now. So if you're all listening to me, now, don't don't add more questions to this, uh, and I'll just finish these, and uh, then I have to get to this uh, planned f uh, phone uh, phone event. So uh, I won't do that again. I want to give you guys as much time as possible. So uh, so I bought you just okay. So could you explain slash shadows? Hi, Paul. How are you? How are your experiences w with working from imagination uh, they're good I mean you know one thing I would have you do is go if you can find it in any of my videos go look and see if you can f there's there's one I think where you'll see uh, uh, an image of three nudes and a sort of a waterfall and I think I talk about it a bit there but this is one I better take under advisement uh, uh, I, it's a big, you're, you're asking, it's a big question. It's going well, it goes really well. Some of, I mean, the longer you do this, the better you do it. And I've spent my life figuring out painting on, based on painting the truth in front of me and then finding myself really enjoying living there. So this whole thing is a world that, much like you'd say somebody else's avocation or my, it's music, my avocation has been imaginative painting uh, along with the other odd couple things I do. But um, uh, so, yeah, I better, uh, I better let that go for now. And uh, yeah, you're, yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks for your appreciation. You're most welcome, people. Um, 
And uh, you guys, you're paying attention to my stuff. You guys probably are all subscribers. Just, just, you can't give me too much stuff. I, I mean, I might offend you by not being able to deal with it all, but I don't get too much, so don't think I am. And, and so be sure to, any of these questions you want me to deal with, just really narrow them down. Like Kofi on that one, that one's probably not quite as specific uh, as I would have to have. You know, how are your experiences? <laughs> That's a pretty big question. But, and their experiences are great, by the way. So you don't, you don't, you'll never not enjoy that aspect of painting, but you'll enjoy it. The more you understand the visual world, the more you're master of the visual world and you're not intimidated anymore. You have confidence in your drawing, your ability to make a thing look like every time. The more you're gonna enjoy this other, other world, which is why it's so much the base. So, uh, but, but that kind of a question, I'll put a very specific thing to it, you know, when you ask me and I'll bring that to a video or something like that. And all you guys, so thank you. Uh, so thank you all very much. Uh, and uh, yeah, and let's, and let's pick this up on another, in another one in a few weeks. Hopefully we can do it in six weeks or so, maybe, maybe eight. All right, Mr. Producer, are we, are we set? S see you all out there, see you in the next video, which will be uh, Thursday this week. Do you wanna, uh, you've got some, your, email, your Facebook and Instagram, is there any way of sharing that? You, want me the, you mean the locations of it and that sort of thing? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. No, I don't have anything. My, the, uh, we have, you can find more information about me on studio.ingbretson.com. Uh, we are, my, uh, I have a Facebook page it's called Boston School Painting. Uh, is it Ingbretson Studio, Boston School Painting, I believe it is. Um, but I think you can find a connection to all those things through the studio.ingbretson.com. Um, some stuff on the, on the screen right now. Oh, good. There's some stuff on the screen. Good. I see it. There yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm sorry you couldn't uh, get that donation over, but um, we'll, we'll sort it out. My producer is right on it. Uh, all those things that gave you, gave you glitches today. All right. And do, uh, guys, let me know any which way you want to communicate with me, email or anything. Just let me know how this is going for you and what you might like to, what you might enjoy seeing even a little bit differently or something I can do that make this kind of more of a, I, one thing I, I was going to be more of an adventure. One thing I didn't do is I didn't show a lot of, a lot of images today and your questions aren't coming that way uh, as much as they might. So if you actually want me to, to um, the one thing that might liven this up a little bit is to have images on the screen, but you're, you're busy staring at me <laughs> in any case, but uh, that's one image, I guess. But so let me know, uh, and, and, or even orient your questions around images. You know, like I was looking at such and such a painting and is this what you mean by such and such or something? Anything like that. And I can, you know, I have a lot of pictures here. If you let me know and at some point I can pull them up. And, and I mean, even during a program like this, I'll be able to pull them, some of those pictures up and we can talk about them actually as pictures. And that's the only thing I can think of. But if you think of other things that you do or that might be useful, uh, making what I'm saying more come across better, I'd appreciate any suggestions. So in any case, all, thank you all for being here uh, this time. And I wish you well in your work and your struggles. And uh, if I could be of any use, just do, do just be in touch, okay? All right, next time.